<laughs> okay, you guys. I actually meant to do this like this afternoon, but I went on an epic sort of walk with my children. Like um, my little ones were riding their bikes and I was walking and we were just out exploring things and it just went on for hours. Um, but I figured it's late. It's technically Saturday or Sunday, depending on where you are. And um, I just wanted to. Oh, this is computer clock. It's so weird. <laughs> My clock is like on East Coast time. Okay, anyway. So um, I wanted to just talk about a few things that have really piqued my interest. And I wanted to start first with um, an article that Cynthia shared with me and actually shared with all of you. I'll try to remember to link her video in the description box um, once this live is over. That was written by um, a black male. And I want to just kind of go into several things that were in this article and just sort of branch out to the overarching conversation of the plot and the concentrated effort to destroy black men and to diminish black masculinity. And I have my special guest here, <laughs> Mr. is here with me. Um, and so I think I will go ahead and share my screen with you guys so that you guys can actually um, look at this article with us as we discuss um, as we discuss it. So let's see. All right, so you guys should be able to see this article now. And so let's go ahead and get into it. Um, this article was written on a website called the Black Youth Project, which is even scary, scarier, by a, a young man named Donnie Moreland. And I'm just gonna read some things and then babe, like as you want to comment or I want to comment, we'll just interrupt <laughs> the reading. So it says, my crushes in high school were all white girls. This is a young black man writing this. I used to fantasize about asking them out, kissing them, having sex with them. It was about the only way by which I judged my social value by, by how many of them I was of interest to. So he judges his social value by being desired by white women. In fact, the first girl to ever hear the words, I love you from me was a white girl. I was learning about something between me and white girls at the same time I was learning American history. And some, oh wait, there's a sound, hold on. So it goes on to say that he was learning about him, his black skin and white girls and it was something he couldn't wash off until he attended Prairie View a and University in Texas. It's interesting he chose a historically black college even though he had a heavy fetish for white women. And he found out that his skin and their skin meant something far different than what he had drawn up in his mind. The only thing that exists between cis heterosexual black men, so he's obviously very new age because he's identifying himself as cis. And this is relevant because later on he says one of his inspirations is a homosexual um, black man. Um, between cis black men and white girls is a closer proximity to loss for us He said, um, the only thing that exists between cis heterosexual black men and white girls is a closer proximity to loss for us. The more we walk the line 
in the confidence of white girls. I'm not suggesting anything about interracial relationships here, given how little of myself needs to be imported onto the intimate happenings of other others. I'm talking about something to do with meaning, what white women mean to us. So he's pondering what white women mean to black men based on what it is we mean to ourselves in proximity to whiteness. But no matter what we impress onto those bodies, they will be bodies of probable danger as history predicts and has yet to be challenged. But this does not change his desire for them. And we'll see that. And he goes on, and this is something I want to talk about too, the use of the word nigga. That's something we're going to get into. Um, he goes on to talk about cultural appropriation and still says that to so many brothers, um, yes, Jules represents a closeness to whiteness that for some represents access to a world away from the Chitlin circuit, so to speak. So having white women in that proximity to whiteness um, means a distance from the trash that is blackness, right? A white world where success isn't framed within a small black box, agitating this fantasy, no matter how disruptive to the lives of black folk it may seem, is a line that many cats are not willing to cross. But there is something we import onto white women, which is far stranger than the mess made with yes jewels. And then this is where he quotes, and we're going to talk about Hilton Owls. Hilton Owls is a black man who is gay. And he won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and he's also very comfortable, in, and I have a clip of this, in engaging in conversations with whites where they use the word nigger with the hard E-R. Um, so he goes on to quote this homosexual man who also has a fixation with whiteness. In his book, White Girls, Hilton Owls describes at length the ways queerness, homosexuality, white womanhood, and black identity converge. So he is analyzing something that a homosexual black man has thought up about how being gay, being black, and being a white woman overlap. I can't even imagine. I would not advise you guys re read the book, Hilton Owls is Trash, but whatever. The book is partially about the obsession we have with white womanhood. A gay man, a gay black man wrote a whole book about the obsession of white womanhood in this full Reddit. The performance of white womanhood. Owls creates an argument centered around white womanhood as something to achieve especially by black queer men in his experience, but certainly by any of us. So he is inspired by a book that says that black men want to achieve white womanhood, meaning you want to become white women. As Alice explained in a 2013 interview with Fader, the question of white womanhood is more to do with marginalization. <laughs> it's interesting that the relation to marginalization is something that he is claiming that black men can associate with white womanhood when no one is more marginalized than black women. So you would think the comparison between be, be, would be between black men and black women, but no, not the case. As Al's explained in a 2013 interview with Fader, the question of white womanhood is more to do with marginalization, visibility, and the space shared between those two antithetical ideas. When asked, what do you mean when you say white girls? Al states, what if we had a book that was about a black man's identification with a white woman? What if we had a book? Th this is the man that these white people gave a Pulitzer Prize to. This is the kind of crap he writes. What if we had a book, and he wrote the book, where a black man's identification that was about a black man's identification with a white woman, 
A woman who is marginal but still has some visibility. What if we inverted black maleness? We would see black femaleness. He literally said, if you invert, if you if you invert black maleness, you will see white femaleness. This man was given a Pulitzer Prize, and the author of this article was inspired by this fool. We have to get a hold of our youth. Understanding the gendered conditionlessness of Al's inquiries. It is as a cis heterosexual black man that I must acknowledge the face of white women, which shapes when you turn us inside out. This one gay man has brainwashed this young black man into actually thinking if you turned a black man inside out, there would be a white woman in there. There would be a white woman in there. Is there some truth to this, mister? Is there some truth to if you turned a black man inside out, there would be a white woman? Um, <laughs> no. I mean, I guess if you're talking about homosexuality and people trying to have this the mesis of white folks, then yes. But this this argument and this article kind of presupposes that black people in general just have this mimetic concept of white folks. So in other words, we always want to be like them, no, no matter the cost. And also was kind of undergirded in this um, kind of elementary article. And I'm not gonna bash your brother because he's from an HBTU, but at the same time, it's kind of undergirded in this kind of article is that black men we really strive to possess what white men have, and that being white women. I mean, later on in an article, he made this analogy with Snoop Dogg. Yes. Um, and it was kind of, you know, so although it, it was one analogy, but he uses these like singular type of analogies. Now, I know it's not a full blown academic article. To me, these articles are kind of cheap because it kind of, it falls into this this um, pop culture identity kind of rhetoric. Like, oh yes, you know, just because of your standpoint, what we call standpoint epistemology, from his purview, right? Based on his feelings as a younger, you know, heterosexual black male, that he, you know, just you know, lusted over white women. And again, that's not something, you know, too out of the, you know, the box, right? Because again, the way society is situated is that whiteness is the aesthetic, right? And so what do we see often, right? Or, or even when we see, you know, our sisters, they're, you know, most of the time of a lighter hue. And so this is nothing new, but again, he said he found that that wasn't the reality, him going to HBCU. But when he quotes owls, and that's problematic because, you know, this, this person, even though he cites um, Baldwin, he's not a James Baldwin. You know, if you're trying to make an argument that, you know, black men, <laughs> are trying to be white women. Really? I mean, to make that break. But, but wait a second. Let's be clear that he said that, um, that Hilton Owls was an inspiration of his and Hilton Owls was inspired by a white woman, a white feminist, a white man, and James Baldwin. 
which I don't vibe with James Baldwin, you guys. You guys know I just don't play the homosexual things. So I just don't vibe with anything Baldwin did. I don't think our community should be openly embracing this man or, or teaching our children about him or even giving the impression that we accept his behavior. But this is a trickle down effect. Um, Hilton Owls was inspired by James Baldwin and then wrote that crazy book about white black men being white women. And now that has inspired this young man to relate to that. And this is the problem with promoting these people in our community. You, you see a literal line because Hilton Owls is quoted many times as saying that James Baldwin is an inspiration to him. Well, and I mean, you, you could have, you, you could definitely make that assertion, but I mean, it's, it's far greater than James Baldwin, in my opinion, although, I get it. He's been inspired by James Baldwin, and I have a different, you know, take on Baldwin than you. You know, outside of his, I mean, it's it's homosexuality. That's that's his deal, right? But this is something that's pervasive within, you know, the academy, within higher ed, and now even within K through twelve spaces. So this type of ideology is 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 pro proliferating, where. It really is, you know, assault on black heterosexual males. And then I will take it a step further and I say when it's an attack on black heterosexual males, it's an attack on also black <laughs> female heteros, you know, heterosexual. Um, so it just doesn't go to one part of our community and it finds its way into creating this bifurcation within our community. And this is what I mean by that. So within our community, of course, you know, we have black members of the LGBT community, um, so on and so forth. And this, these type of things cause a rift. And now I know your position now is like, listen, they can be part of our community. Okay, that's, that's your opinion. However, they are, but they seem as if, in my opinion, that they're trying to distance themselves from other black folks. And they're trying to, you know, lambaste and look and really malign people who are heterosexual and don't necessarily get down that way. And so to me, it's very hypocritical because, you know, they're very, you know, those in the LGBT community are very sensitive. And people might say that's a pun, but when it comes to any type of, you know, political correctness are not being politically correct when it comes to saying anything remotely offensive about them. But on the other end, you could say anything, especially, you know, politically incorrect regarding a heterosexual black male. And I would think that argument could be extended to heterosexual black women. But, but let's be clear that this article was written by a heterosexual black male. Who and is and, and what, when what we mean. talk about when we start talking about well it does like this it doesn't matter their sexuality let's be clear that that heterosexual black male who attended a black college a historically black college was inspired by Hilton Owls a homosexual black man who I can pull up a clip where we see him talking to a white man who uses the word nigger with impunity in, around him but we could never use the word fact with impunity around them. And you guys know, I don't use that word. I don't believe in using those epithets, but nevertheless, right? And Hilton Owls was inspired by yet another Baldwin, homosexual black man. So Whoa. this is like, and, and, and this is all, and so somebody in the chat was saying, Giles was saying, well, screw them. You know, let nature take its course, you know, and eradicate the weak and effeminate. But here's the problem, is that it is pervasive in that we watch generationally, three generations now to all the way moving into a healthy heterosexual black man, a mentality being passed where he literally thinks if you inverted him, he would be a white woman. Well, what and, I'm saying. And we'll pretend like Hilton Owls does not have influence, babe, because he won a Pulitzer Prize. Well, I'm not saying he doesn't have influence alone, but I'm saying this is part of the ideology of this is part of the proliferation that is very much 
becoming normalized now, whether it's in the academy, whether it's in you know higher ed of any regard, and even in K through 12 spaces. That's my argument. That's what I'm saying. These conversations are not something that are being fully vetted. It's just it's just an article where I mean, there's no citation. I mean, this is not a historical article where you, it has to be vetted. People just write down things that they believe, and people say, "Oh, okay." And you will have one author who's real, who's written this, you know, this book is blasphemous in my opinion. But again, he pretty much placates to the impenders to white people, and he has he happens to be a homosexual black male, and that's going even further his, you know, matter of getting you know these prestigious awards, accolades, and so forth, because he is. Yes, I can hear you. All right, thank you. Go ahead, babe. He was just asking if we could hear. No, go ahead. No, no, that's that's it. Oh no, I was just I was asking if she could hear me. I'm I'm just waiting for you guys to get to a point where I feel like I can join in. What go ahead, join in. Well, I I wasn't really engaged in the conversation. I was trying to fix the mic and all that. Okay. okay. So I think that this is interesting. And I, I want you to join in now because you said, and I could think of some ways too, but I don't want to trigger anybody, but I might have to do some triggering. Well, how does my how does my mic quality sound first and foremost? It sounds oh. fine. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And you, were, you were saying that you could see how an argument could be made that, and I'm I'm paraphrasing; these aren't your exact words. That if you inverted a black man, he would be a white woman. Um, and I would say that's not universal, but I can definitely see that in some black men. Although oh, I'm yeah. disgusted with the assertion, but but what did you mean when you said that? Well, I don't necessarily think that it's all black men, but I think that the general um, dichotomy of the black man would be the, either an over masculinity or an overcompensated masculinity or a com incomplete domesticity. So what I mean by that is that we all know that a lot of uh you know black men are raised without a father in the home so they don't really have any masculine energy to begin with so that means that they'll either create a pseudo masculine trait or they'll just embrace what their mother was now if the mother's a pseudo masculine that's probably where they get the masculine energy from where they get all rowdy and all of that other stuff and try and pick fights with people but what I see most often is that the males sort of become like their mothers and the feminine, if that makes any sense. So you'll see an invert. Matter of fact, I was just talking about this. I put this in the chat. Remember, I put in the chat that some black women at my school told me that they felt like black men needed black women, but black women didn't need black men. And they said the reason for this was because they felt like black women were more competent and that black women were stronger. And I thought about that in the time that they were saying it. Um, and I thought about how, what the black women would say to me about the men at my school, uh, about them not wanting to date them. And they would basically say that they were too feminine, that they weren't you know, the stereotypical masculine man and what i found also from that is very important because i don't well this is going to get a little bit off topic but i you know how there's the stereotype that black women only want to date thugs right hello i mean it's been said yeah oh yeah well here's the thing i think that the reason why you get that is because black women are looking for a sense of masculinity and they don't find that. So they go for the pseudo masculine, which is the thugs and X, Y, Z, because that's basically what they find around them. So that's just a long winded way of me saying that the women are basically the people that you should observe in this scenario, because the women are observing the men. And the women don't think that the men are masculine at all. So whenever they find any trace of masculinity, they're clinging to it. 
So I think that this is a, that you can just look at how the women treat the black men and how the women observe the black men in general to see the trend. Because like I said, you can see it, you could see it for the last maybe 30, 40 years where there's a complete inversion of the gender roles in the black community where the women want to be the men or the women feel like they have to act as the men and the men are playing 2K or playing Madden and they're sitting at the house and while their wife makes while their wife works two jobs or you know does whatever to take care of the house so yeah i i would somewhat agree that there is a large section of the black community that has become essentially pseudo white women that they stay home and they take care of the house like the stereotypical feminine woman. I would, I, I see where you're coming from. And when I was thinking I could see it, I was thinking in in the hatred. And again, I, we're talking about a particular sect of black men, not all black men, right? Including pr present company. So obviously my next statement is going to exclude present company. But there is a sector of black men who hate black women I think that's something they can share with white women, right? There's a sector of black men that want to have a close proximity to white masculinity and whiteness. And I think that's something that they share with white women. There's a sector of black men that like to compare themselves, right? And um, measure themselves by their female counterparts in the way that white women compare and measure themselves against other women. Um, there's a sector of black men who are subservient to white men. And that is the role traditionally taken by their women, <clears throat> even in feminism, right? Um, and there's a sector of black men who desire dominance over the white man, but try to achieve it in passive aggressive ways. And we see whole movements of white women doing that, such as the feminist movement, right? Where they try to assert dominance by use of passive aggressiveness because they can't physically fight their men, right? So they've taken another approach. So I can see how that could be said, but I want to be very clear that I'm disgusted because when I look at how we got to this point, and perhaps black women had something to do with it because um, Hilton Al had a mother, right? He had a mother who obviously failed with him because he was not only homosexual, but he went on to obsessively write book after book after book about race relations where he idolized whiteness. So much so that they finally gave him a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> You know what I mean? They were just like, this is just the kind of Negro we love. <laughs> and he was influenced, right, by somebody else who was failed, which was James Baldwin. And so we see this pollution generationally, now third generation, three generations deep, and we have to look at who inspired Baldwin. I Maybe we could drag it back further, right? But just looking at those three generations, three generations deep, we now have a young man, probably close to your age, Dark Prophet, um, yeah. who is, his mind is befuddled. And I think the examples I used is not necessarily, although some of it was, because he talked about proximity to whiteness, is not necessarily um, how he sees it, but this weird, emulsion of him recognizing that white women are dangerous because that's how he closes the article to say that they are dangerous that they could be the cause of a life of a, the loss of life to a black man but he also is obsessed with them and he also feels that black men are them black men are white women that socially black men are closest to white women and i, I just it boggles the mind um, Ms. Well, yeah, I think we just have to be really mindful and cautious about having this type of 
what is it, Ma and Han report kind of revisionist type of thought process when we're talking about um, women, black women in particular, you know, raising, you know, single black women raising children, right? Because to me, when I hear those types of, of tropes, to me, it's, it's, it's a, it's a shot at black women, right? Because there's not a man around. So therefore, you know, the traits that this person, this, this man, this, this young male in particular is either going to be toxic or um, hyper feminine, you know, these types of things. And which is not always the case, of course. But, you know, I, I look at these types of, com or listen to these types of conversations and Black women, although we're talking about, you know, Black community in particular, but they're not the only ones who have raised um, children alone. You know what I mean? And this is not always the case where Black women are raising them alone. Now, they may not have the father or the partner in the home with them, but when you look at Black men in particular, they're the most um involve you know fathers of any other um identity group right and so we have to look at that but it's a it's a slap at the mom because these black mothers have done humans work as far as raising these kids and they've had ex they've had extended family help they've had village they had uncles they had grandfathers they had other men just because the father may have not been involved in the process doesn't mean that this automatically is going to turn into a pathological situation. So I think we have to be careful when we're framing it that way. And, and like I said earlier, it really is a slap at the black women. So when the brother was talking earlier about, you know, the women, you know, are working and they get these opportunities, so on and so forth, this is true. Because a lot of times these corporations view, you know, these black men or they situate them within these same pathological tropes like, oh, well, you're going to get this opportunity. Now, there may be they, they may have some merit to getting these opportunities. Right. But they're looking at them in a way in which like, OK, you have to have this kind of like edge to you. You know, you have to be kind of like this aggressive, angry black woman because your man isn't shit. So therefore, we're going to allow you this position. And what this does is create this bifurcation in the community within black women and black men. I mean, we look at the disparity um, rates when we're talking about education, economics, so on and so forth. I mean, when we're talking about the black community. Men are the only <laughs> look at everybody else, maybe within the Latinx community, but I even think in the Latinx community, the men are at the lead of every social indicator, except for the black community. And that's not done unintentionally. And I think where this conversation is going to go is where we see the construction of the feminization of the black males kind of helping that. And here's the irony within that statement. And there's research that backs this up. And we talked about this in different shows. If you are a black man and you're part of the LGBT community, the likelihood of you are um, getting positions and climbing up the ladder are much higher than if you are a heterosexual male, black male. And so there are many factors and pitfalls out there that we need to be mindful of. And even historically, that really caused these situations. So. We just need to be careful when we're making these statements because we don't want to make it seem as if we're, you know, maligning black women or black men who have to go through hell to even get their foot into the door. And if we're not aware of this bifurcation that is artificial, right? It's constructed, black men and black women, and even I will say black members of the LGBT community. We're going to be at odds with each other, and we're not going to be able to eradicate the situation. I want to look at this um, 
in a little more depth, right? Because to me, this is part of, because think about at the heart of this article, we have a young black man, a young black man who is openly acknowledging. So let me back it up. We have a young black man inspired by a Pulitzer Prize winning black author who is gay, who says that black men are inverted black women. And now we have a young black man of the millennial generation or whatever they're calling them, who- Gen Z. Gen Z, thank you. Who um, believes that this is true. Now, as we were doing this, I because this is about the destruction of the black man, let me share my screen again. I went ahead and I went to Google and I typed in two things, okay? I typed in two things. I typed in, and I'll show you here, black men, black men in a dress, right? Black men in a dress. And you could see I was able to get lots of black men in dresses. Remember, black men initially wore dresses as a joke, right? To entertain people. Black men were initially wearing dresses as a form of entertainment and comedy, right? And then we started seeing them really wearing dresses, not for entertainment purposes, but like as an actual style, as an actual look. We saw them on the catwalks. As I'm clipping through this pi these pictures, you guys can see that. We saw them on catwalks in dresses. Recently, Pharrell um, presented in a dress. I believe Nyla showed a, a man, you know, in sandals and a, you know, biker shorts, but like an outfit. Do you know what I mean? Like a checkered tight outfit from head to mid thigh. Here we have a black man wearing thigh highs and a dress. Um, so, but I want you to see how easy it was for me to find. Look, I could just go on and on and there's no shortage of black men in dresses. Here, they're not even in a dress. They're just being feminine right? It's some black and Latin men just being feminine. Now I did white men in a dress. Now there are a couple of pictures, but look at most of them. What are most of these men wearing? Suits. Most of them are wearing button up shirts. I said in a dress. They gave me white men in dress shirts, y'all. That's just a, a, Google, a Google search, right? Tons of black men in dresses. If I put the same thing with white men, I get a couple of pictures, but really I get just a lot of white men in dress shirts because that must be what I meant, right? Which is just interesting <laughs> to me. It's fascinating. But with that said, I want to talk about how there has been a push and... Um, I, I looked at this when uh, I was thinking about uh, transgender, and I'm gonna I'm gonna step lightly here because Mister's in the room. When I was yeah. talking about um, when I was listening to the Democratic fiasco, um, and how they were saying trans men were dying. I'm gonna be doing a whole video on this, but you guys will just have to believe me for now and know that I plan to give you the stats in the next week. Um. Trans black men, trans people in general, transsexual people in general are the least likely to be harmed of all Americans. Like the general American population has a rate of murder five times higher than trans people, right? If we look at the per capita stats, black men have a rate of murder about five times higher than black trans people specifically black men who try to present themselves as women, which is the demographic that they are saying is in danger. There were a total, the latest stat that we have of 23 trans people who died in a year. 23, right? Now granted of trans people that die, black men are disproportionately represented by a percentage of 75%. But black men are disproportionately represented in death statistics by murder across the board. And ultimately a trans 
person who is a black man dressing as a woman is still a black man. So they would fall within that statistic, but they are still five times less likely to be killed than a regular schmegular black guy who is not transsexual. So then what is the push to make black men the face of transsexualism, even though they make up only a small part of that population? You know, like 60% of the population are white men. The next biggest demographic are Hispanics. The third biggest demographic are black men. So is there a push to simply make black men effeminate overall? And we see this in the article, right? Where you have a young black man saying that he's essentially a woman and not just any woman, but a white woman. Well, I definitely think there is a push, right? I think there's a push and I think you can add some nuance to some of those statistics you shared and, you know, regarding the sex work and aspect. And again, that's not to give any, you know, exoneration towards murder, right? Towards, you know, killing of an individual. Um, but we also have to take into account of this, and this may be very controversial, but there's been a lot of conversation about trans identity, right? Because, you know, surgery or what have you has become really good as far as not knowing who in the hell, you know, the original um, orientation, um, gender of an individual was. And then when people have found out, of course, you know, going to extremes and may have led to um, the murder and exterminating of that trans person. Again, I'm not, you know, saying that's a condoning of those type of situations. But again, those things are realities. But to your initial kind of like thesis is, yes, I, I mean, I think there's been a slow proliferation of, you know, the emasculization of black males. And now I think it's now coming more normalized, um, especially with, you know, feminist and LGBTQ rhetoric with it now being normalized within curriculums, within K through 12 spaces, within the political correctness in higher ed and, you know, making sure things such as pronouns are clearly, you know, announced, pronounced, um, so that you are, you know, making it a safe and inclusive space. You know, so these are real life things that are occurring um, that are part and parcel to, to me, and I share your opinion about the feminization of you know, black men. And and I think it's just very hypocritical, like I said earlier, because, you know, if you say anything remotely politically incorrect, you know, concerning this particular demographic, this particular um, group of folks with an LGBT community, you know, your your livelihood could be taken, you know, but you, you juxtapose that when you're talking about, you know, a black male in particular, you could say anything, you know, politically incorrect towards a black male and there will be no, <laughs> nothing will happen to you. Hell, you could go right into a, a black male's apartment and shoot him, you know, while he's eating cookies or cereal, right? So there's nothing like that's going to happen, you know, to you when you say something and or do something untowards or politically correct uh, towards a black male. And so this hypocrisy is, is, it's crazy because, again, people are getting really bent about a shape about a pronoun, but less bent about a shape about the loss of someone's life. And I find that highly problematic. Well, uh, I want to, well, I've been thinking for the, I've been thinking for the last few minutes and I wanted to go back and address one of uh, your points whenever you're talking about single mothers. I think that it was important well not i think wait let me let me think of the word uh well i'll just talk and, and you guys will 
eventually understand what I'm getting at. I think that the phraseology that you used was important because you were talking about how it was dangerous to sort of make some sort of indictment of single mothers or black women and all of that other jazz. Um, and I've been, I've talked to Aunt Irene about this before, um, about the idea that I believe that you should be able to confront the idea of single mothers not necessarily being the best place to raise a child, especially a young black child. But that's neither here nor there, because at this point, I believe that's axiom. Um, and axiom means that it's so self-evident that it doesn't need explaining. Um, so uh, what I think happens is you have that sort of attitude in the generalized black community where you can't con you can't really speak about what happens whenever you have a single black mother in most cases not every case because as we said this we've established in this entire conversation that it isn't necessarily every single case but in many cases and we can dare say most cases these two um these two scenarios that i laid out before are what you generally get but why i said that i felt it was important that we looked at how you analyze that was because i think that that's what happens a lot in the black community we don't want to question the idea of our own mothers because between what is it like 76 and 80 percent now of black women are single mothers um, we don't really want to confront the idea that our mothers may have done some great sin to us, but we have to be able to confront that if we want to be able to confront ourselves. We can't confront ourselves until we can until we convict in our minds what our parents have done to us to make us into the people that we are. And I think that that's where a lot of the problems in the black community comes from. We can't convict ourselves because we can't convict our parents because we're afraid to. If we, if we talk about our own parents, society will lambast us, our own brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles will lambast us. So I think that that's first and foremost. But what I think that you get from that is a cycle wherein you have these black men that are feminized, and then you have these black men, black women that have no faith in the black man. So you have black women that see black men are, as feminized, Wait, somebody just knocked on my wall and it it threw me off. So you see black women that see black men as feminized. And so the black woman loses faith in the black man. And then they go to these same, you know, pseudo masculine people that I was telling you about. And then the process starts all over again. The black woman is bitter towards the black man because she feels like A, they aren't masculine enough or B, the ones that she feels is masculine enough, the pseudo masculine are the people that will never stay around for. Her. So you have a machine of single mothers that never gets confronted because we can't confront our own parents. We can't confront the idea of single motherhood as a system. And if we can't confront the idea of single motherhood as a system, then we'll never be able to confront anything in the black community because you'll still have a machine that creates feminized men and you'll have women that see these feminized men and will not date them and will not marry them. And then when you have that, you're going to just create more single mothers and the process is going to repeat all over again. And this is this is something I theorized for years, but I literally heard black women saying this over the last few months because it's quote unquote cuffing season. And as we know, the the women in general start coming out to try and, you know, mate and get boyfriends or whatever. Um, and yeah, that's basically the general consensus from the black woman. And like I said, if you look at the women in any community, they'll tell you what the state of the men are, because there's no, there's no one that knows the state of a man more than a woman, honestly. So can I, let me ask you a question. All right. If a, if, if a mother has a house, okay. And there's another adult in that house, a blood relative. Okay. And she has a child and um, she just leaves the child in the house and never comes back. And while she's gone 
or maybe she comes back, you know, checks periodically or whatever. But while she's gone, the relative that's in the house does egregious things to the child. Does the mother have any responsibility in that? Hmm. Or is it completely on the adult that the child was left with? Well, in a legal sense, it would be negligence. No, just, in, in, forget a legal sense. In a moral sense, do you feel that the onus is completely on the adult that perpetrated that harm? Or do you think the mother has some accountability for having completely just neglected her duties as a mother because, hey, there's another adult there, you know, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to do me. Do you know what I mean? Whatever it is that she goes off to do. Well, I don't think, well, obviously both of them have responsibility because- Okay, wait, no, stop, her. stop there. Stop there. Don't we'll get ahead of me. Okay. So I paint this picture because I view parenting that way, right? So I cannot disagree with you that the parent that is present obviously has a huge responsibility. And, and I say this goes both ways. If you develop an amazing child, then I give most of the credit to the parent who was there for sick days and, you know, for recitals and for questions whenever the child are, you know, taking the child outside daily, like nothing, it has more impact than the parent that is in the home, right? Even if there's a parent outside of the home that's active, it's not the same as being in the home. But in the same breath, I would say that if something goes wrong, that much weight is put on the parent in the home because you are always present. However, to me, if a parent leaves the home, be it be that person male or female, you are like that mother who left your child in a house with someone else and completely neglected the parenting part of it, right? Or came in for the parenting part of it once a week or once a month or once, you know, whatever it was. And so then you go, oh, well, then that person in the house is responsible. No, some of that responsibility lies to you because what a parent is, is a person that is actively and consistently and aggressively involved in the molding of a child. And when you neglect that, not only is anybody who perpetrates a wrong against that child or rears them wrongly responsible, but the other person that helped create that child, be it the man or the woman, whoever's not present, is equally responsible. You don't not have responsibility from omission. So if we are to address the issue, I say we must address Black women in the home, right, who are single parents and failing at that. And we also must address the fact that there is not the second parent around who is also failing at being a parent. You have two failures of parents that create failures of people, right? That's not, the onus is not on one or the other. Well, I, I think well, not, I what, think your point is well wait, taken. Can I say something real quick? Wait, wait Mr. Wait, your wait. mic, your mic is, uh, your mic is acting up a little bit. It's like got a foam noise to it. Like I can't, it's muffling everything. I can't really hear anybody. Oh, let him try. Try to speak, babe. Yeah, it's still. still the same way? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. We'll probably have to no, I was, I'll let him go ahead first. Okay. Good. No, no, no. I wasn't interrupting you for a response. I was interrupting you because the foam sound was distracting me. Because I like to, you know, filter in everything that I hear before I make a response. No, okay. All good, brother. No, um, so what Irene's saying is is very true. Um, and it's it sounds like it's an obvious type of situation, right? But it's very taboo to, and I hate to say this, to hold, you know, a lot of our sisters accountable. You know, so a lot of this, you know, these negative tropes, you know, the pathology around parenting generally falls on the male. You know, and so that narrative is pervasive, not the narrative like, hey, you know, we both have skin in the game here. And so whether I am being neglectful or, you know, I am, you know, presenting, you know, our child and putting them in peril, or if I'm disallowing you to be part of, 
this child's or children's, you know, um, life, you know, those type of things aren't really conveyed or expressed because, again, it just, it's not a thing about accountability is a thing more, uh, it's a situation more of blame. I want to blame you. I'm not going to be accountable. We're not going to look to see what's in the best interest of the child. We're just going to, you know, piss on each other and place the blame and, you know, further this bifurcation between brothers and sisters. And that's not getting us anywhere at all. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think I can jump in at this point, too. Um, well, yeah, I agree with basically everything that you said. I'm not going to say everything because I, you know, you're talking, we're talking in real time. So I'm, I don't want to, you know, put a label on everything that you said because I don't remember it 100%. Um, but uh, back to what Aunt Irene was saying um a little bit earlier you know about the idea of having both parents held accountable uh i didn't feel like it was necessary to say that the men that left these women um weren't accountable or wait hold on i think I'm left the children that. let's be clear they yeah no I, I i mean people talk about it seven ways to sunday about deadbeat dads and all of that other stuff so like I said before about certain things being axiom, I think that the idea of deadbeat dads has been a thoroughly established in American culture and especially black culture by now since the last 60 or 70 years. So I didn't necessarily think it, you know, too necessary to, to address that in this conversation. Um, but like I said before, I don't necessarily think that the indictment is wholly on the parents as a whole, because like I said, it's the mechanism which both parents belong to that is more to blame than anything. Because I see every day that there are, quote unquote, and I know this is going to sound a little bit cliche, good black women, and I put air quotes around that, um, that sort of fall to this mechanism every day because they can't bring themselves to trust black men in general. And then when they do that, they push the black men that could be viable for them and that they are attracted to that aren't thugs away because they don't want to have a submissive feminine role because they don't trust black men. So I think that, like I said before, a lot of this is what feeds the mechanism, the idea that you can't indict your parents and all of that other stuff that I've said thus far. Because when you have people that can't, um, when you have women that can't trust the men, they're not going to become submissive women that the men can love. And so the men are going to start resenting the women because they don't feel like a, if the women do like them, they aren't going to submit to them and act like actual women. So you have to deal with a masculine man. And I think that that's really where a lot of the resentment that you were talking about earlier of black men towards black women comes from. I think that, and this is also going to sound a little bit cliche, I think that this is a huge misunderstanding between black men and black women because they're both feeding into the system and they're not confronting the reasons why they do certain things because they both have to fight against each other for reasons that are completely avoidable, but they're because they won't confront themselves or confront their parents to address these things that are very much, um, what's the word, not fixable. I don't think fixable is a word, but you get the idea. Um, yeah, they aren't putting in the work to be able to fix these very minor, relatively minor inconveniences. And so, yeah, like I was saying, that, I, that's where I think that a lot of the conflict between black men and black women comes from black men black women don't feel like they can trust black men black men resent them for it or and they don't want to date the black women that may very well be good because they feel like black women don't trust them and black women won't submit to them and then at the same time black women are always seeming to be skeptical of black men because they feel like either a they're gonna be single mother makers that I that's that's what I'm gonna start calling uh you know the baby daddy types the single mother maker or they feel like they're gonna be simps and lames so there's no real middle ground in the mind of either person or of either of either party which is basically what's pushing each one apart at least that's my humble opinion I just want to um 
I want to address what you said about um, you felt like because the conversation about the deadbeat dad has been spoken about into the dust, and I agree, that you wanted to focus on the other side of that and you didn't see a need to include that. I would say to create an atmosphere in our community where the conversations are helpful and healthy and not polarized, that what we don't hear, right? So we hear about the women, we hear about the men, and we've been hearing about them longer than the women, right? But we hear about the women, we hear about the men, but the conversation that we always need to present is the real conversation, which is where we talk about everybody, right? At one time. And I think those are, should be the only way that we have this conversation because every time we have these conversations, we are only speaking about one group or the other. But the reality is it's both groups. And so every time we address a community issue, a family issue, issue with children, anything like that, then we need to be inclusive of all parties responsible and never isolate the conversation on a polar because that has been the problem to this point. And it also is not realistic to progress because it takes that middle ground for progress to be made. Also, Smile to Joy was saying that, you know, it's, um, I wish our conversation included two parent homes and the children still being dysfunctional. And you guys can, chime in on this, but I just want to say to that, that that would make sense if we had a higher concentration of two parent homes in the black community, right? So we are having the conversation based on what the majority of our community is experiencing. And although black fathers are very active, having two parents in the home, and, and this was the norm in my family, like most of the children in my family had two parents in the home but that's not the norm for the black community. So we can discuss that, but obviously, um, and this is just my opinion, the guys can say, you know, what theirs is. To me, it's more beneficial to have the conversation that applies to the greater part of the black community. And I think that's why these conversations often take on a face of discussing single mother-led households, because that is, the household that so many of our people come from, most of our people come from, unfortunately. Um, so is, is yeah, it my turn to respond or is it Mr. Yeah, go Buffer? ahead. No, it doesn't matter, whichever. Oh no, because I was expecting Mr. DeBuffer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I was waiting for, I was waiting to see who would come in. <laughs> but no, uh, I, yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. And that's sort of what I was getting at um, when I said that I feel like we should be able to get around the whole misunderstanding between both parties. But at the same time, and this is something I've commonly said to uh, a particular woman, I think I might have told you about the said particular woman one time um, at my school, um, but I'm not going to get into the whole story of that. But the gist of the situation was that she thought that I was being very hostile when I would try and have certain conversations with her. And it basically took a very long time for me to sort of beat it into her head that I'm just like, no, I think that the one person that I could have this conversation with is you. And you're like, you're sort of fixated on the idea of protecting ego or protecting pride or whatever, that you're sort of assuming motive for me saying the certain sort of things that I've been saying. Um, and I think that that happens a lot more often than not, because she was one of the quote unquote, good black women's, well, good black women <laughs> uh, that I was talking about or alluding to. Um, that falls into the same sort of situation that I was describing. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that especially the women that aren't necessarily at that same class still fall into that category too, where in they don't really want to confront um, certain things about the quote unquote greater black female community because they feel like it's so deeply tied into their ego and indicting that is basically indicting 
themselves because for some reason i think a lot of black women feel like if you indict black women as a whole you're indicting black women as an individual yeah that's fair enough um mister do you have anything to add to this because if you do please do say it and if you don't i kind of want to move on to use of the word nigga <laughs> <laughs> and the controversy like surrounding that because um, a lot of people have been using it. Let me just say, none of these people do I know who they are. Well, I know who Fat Joe is, right? But the rest of these people, I don't know who these people are and I don't care. But I personally don't use the word. Um, I don't care for people using the word, but I'm not the word police, so I don't try to stop anybody. But with that said, I think that it is interesting to make a word um, kind of like a cultural word, and cultural I mean American, <laughs> you know what I mean? That American Blacks have used it so much, put it in their music, um, that they basically give out to everybody. Now, granted, I understand we don't have control over the distribution of mass media, but our people are participating in it and our people have embraced and normalized the use of the word. And so whilst I don't think anybody should be saying it, black or otherwise, um, if black people choose to use it, that's their choice but to believe that this is not going to trickle out and other people are not going to start using it, I think is very ignorant. And I think makes really an argument for us not using it amongst ourselves at all because we don't have control over this thing, nor are we capable or willing of exacting control over it. Is this going to be one of those times again where I have to sort of step in the field of void, <laughs> the silence? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Rob. I'm just listening. Oh, um, well, I, I'll be honest. I haven't really given it that much thought. When I was younger, I had a very visceral reaction as well to the idea of people using the N-word. But at the same time, I do feel like it's become such a thing in culture especially black American culture, that it's like, if you have a visceral reaction to, to it every time, you're not gonna, you're basically just gonna be disgusted all the time. And so I, it's, it's human for you to build a resistance to natural disgust if you're exposed to that disgust all the time, which I think was the whole point of people, um, you know, making the N word into a cultural staple. But at the same time, it has sort of gotten a little bit out of hand. And by a little bit out of hand, I do, I mean uh, a lot of it out of hand. So yeah, I haven't really, yeah, like that's that's basically the only position that I can have on that is that you, you can't really have a disgust, you can't really have a reaction of disgust to it because you're going to hear it at some point of the day. You can probably say you'll hear it a hundred times a day and you'll probably hear it at least probably three times a day. So like you were saying, there's really no use fighting it at this point. So the, the words matter, um, but I don't necessarily get caught up in as far as black folks utilizing the term. Um, you know, I know there's a whole debate as far as it being a term of endearment or it has its roots in just the most vile, you know, term on the planet Earth, right? And again, it goes back and forth to it being, you know, this term of endearment is something just black folks have possession over. Um, my, my take on this is just like, as far as non-black people utilization of it, I don't think they should. When I teach my course, I said, listen, you know, of course, in the context of 
you know, sharing an article or some historical document. Um, and sometimes I may say the N word or sometimes I may say the actual word, but it goes back to me as far as, you know, the lack of political correctness when it, when it comes to black people. I know earlier I said black men, but when it comes to black people, I mean, it's specifically heterosexual black people. So we could be anything, like Irene said earlier, you know, I, I often, you know, wondered why, like on cable TV, like a TBS or a TNT, where, you know, they would say the N-word, you know, just, you know, just freely, like it was no big deal, you know, but any other term, like, you know, bitch or any term like that, or, you know, anything towards homosexual or LGBT community, they made sure that they beat that out. And so th to me, those are the type of things that we need to be aware of. And again, I know there's an argument towards, you know, well, if we don't start, if we don't stop utilizing the term, we can't get mad at anyone else. Okay, grant that. But my thing is the treatment of us, because they still treat us like that word. So I'm more concerned with the treatment that black folks receive other than some word that has a lot of power, but I think sometimes we give it more power than it should have. I think that um, it's so disingenuous because we do this a lot in the black community and we popularize it. We use insulting words toward each other and mask it with endearment. And I think it's really um, an expression of self-hate. So we use bitch, we use nigga. And let me tell you something. Have I heard the word be used as a term of endearment? Yes. But I've also, and I think if we are honest, also heard it been used and it's not a term of endearment around us. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that's my nigga term of endearment. Bitch ass nigga, not term of endearment. Do you know what I mean? Nigga, shut the fuck up. That's not a term of endearment. That's putting somebody in their place. And that is more of the vibe of how it used to be used amongst us when we were mimicking slave masters. We do that with bitch too, right? You can call a woman a bitch and it's negative. And then you have women calling each other bitches. And I think this is, in the black community, we do this. We take words that are violent and hurtful and we normalize calling each other. It's like if we all started calling each other stupid and trying to make it cool. But the reality is I think there's a deeper level to that, right? which is why also we feel it's problematic for other people to say it because we are not divorced from the reality of what's being said. Well, A or E-R. We're not divorced from the reality. But what we are divorced from is our own cognitive dissonance that allows us to start using a derogatory word toward each other and it morphs from good to bad, or I should say it morphs from what we want to project it as good back to its real meaning as bad based on how we feel about the nigga we're speaking to. Do you know what I'm saying? And then the truth of what's being said comes out. I think this is just another form of self-abuse in the black community. Now, again, I wouldn't police our people saying it. I respect people's rights to say it. I don't use it. Like literally, this is legit. Probably the most you guys have ever heard me use that word. <laughs> I would yeah, never. Stop. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I would never direct it at anybody because I can never divorce A or E R. I don't care how anybody says it. I personally cannot divorce it from what I know it is, and when I hear it spit with vitriol between us, when it's not a term of endearment, something inside of me just cringes up. Um, but I do think we have lost control over this thing because we've we've put wings on it by constantly throwing the word at each other. But like I was saying earlier, there's no political, you know, incorrectness in this 
or incorrectness associated with the term. There, there's nothing, you know. So, take the term faggoting or the term niggardly. You know, even around those terms are farting, right? And all these are kind of like old terms and everything, but they have you know real definitions associated with them, like niggardly, you know, stingy, you know, faggoting has to do with embroidery, farting, you know, doing makeup. However, you use these terms and you could use them in a correct manner, you know, properly in a sense and everything, but people will assume that you're being, you know, politically incorrect and there will be a whole lot of fallback, you know, because of your utilization of these terms. And so that's why I'm saying there's nothing really, there's no teeth associated with this debate. That's why I really don't get into it because this debate has been around for a long time. I mean, there's a real good um, YouTube take on this when um, Dr. West and Dr. Eric Dyson, when they were cool, when they debated this, you know, the utilization of the N word, right? And so both sides have, you know, great merit. But I'm like, again, like I said earlier, I'm more concerned with the ways in which we are being treated like that opposed to the term, the terminology, the names and everything, because this debate could go on for eons and it's really not going to change because it's based upon the way some people were raised in a family where it was used a lot and some families didn't utilize it at all. I am surprised you would say that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. I, I just you know, I, I, I've, I've sort of had have my idea and I feel like you might benefit from talk having the floor first because you know how I like to rationalize my things and it'll take me a while. So you can go ahead, Irene. No, I was just going to say I'm surprised to hear you say that, babe, because as an educator, we know that words have power, right? So we would not go around and as a mother you know, I would not call my children stupid, right? I wouldn't um, go around and, you know, use words, no matter how I try to rephrase them. I'm even weird about calling children bad. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, or it casually using words that no matter what the presentation is, even if you change it to, you know, don't act stupid right? I'm not calling you stupid. I'm saying don't act stupid, right? That that is something that has been internalized. But this is more of a question of the collective outrage we try to have in the Black community when other people selectively use the word. And, you know, and, and we've already positioned ourselves to bring this element that has a level of pollution in the black community into a wider community and then be outraged when the word becomes again commonplace as it was when we were literally nothing more than cattle in people's eyes. The word is used that commonly now. We've literally pushed ourselves back in time, right? To where now, the very same people who had power over the word before are retaking power over the word. Um, well, those people never stopped having power in the first place. So, I mean, the utilization of the term, whether we use it or not, it didn't stop that. And that's my argument. It's like, yes, you may disagree or say we should be able to use the term, you know, as freely as we like. That's not my, okay, so be it. But they don't have to use the word. But if you're in a position of subservient, if you're always working for them, or if they have control and power over you in dominion and can determine if you get hired or fired, determine who's, if they could just eliminate you, kill you, right? If they have that type of power, essentially, they don't have to use the word. They're showing you what you are the word. And that's my bigger concern. How can we thwart that instead of having this kind of conversation? In my opinion, it's kind of meaningless on us utilizing this and having this kind of like really, you know, this this fake anger, this fake outrage 
and when somebody utilizes the term outside of our community, when we're getting treated like that, and even worse, even worse than the ways in which they're acting towards us. So that's my argument. Well, I actually, I would like to speak to that real quick, and I'll try and be short. Uh, I can't see his name because it's behind the. Uh, it, 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 the it's the wa- it's the wacky world of old TV. I would like to say uh, hello, everyone on the panel. Yeah, I, I'll respond after you're done. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so, um, I I can see where you're coming from, Mister. But at the same time, I I would have to side on Irene on this one because I've been speaking about you know, the deeper seated psychological issues that are going on in the black community and how I feel like that that's more damaging than anything. Because as we've been saying for generations, a lot of this is still, you know, passed down from slave days and all that. So it's it's not even a secret that a lot of these deep seated psychological things exist, but we don't even confront them. We know that they're there. We just don't confronted at all. So this goes perfectly with what Irene was saying, basically in the idea that we're saying this word, and even though we aren't addressing the idea that it has power, or we're trying to quote unquote, take back the power, it does have some deep seated psychological thing. And the reason why I feel like that is because I remember um, last year, um, I have pretty long hair, as uh, Auntie has seen. Um, so some of the black women would talk about, talk bad about me. And you know, like some of them would be like, "Oh, how'd you get your hair so long?" and all that other stuff. But other ones would be sort of, you know, a little bit jealous and start trying to make fun of me, you know, schoolhouse type stuff. And one of the same women that would do it. Um, was doing her hair one day because it was in a, uh, we were in theater together. She was doing her hair one day because we had to, we had to wear it down because it was a slave, uh, it was a slave narrative that we were playing. So we had to have it down naturally. Um, And she says that she hated her natural hair. And it was a bit of a Freudian slip because she would talk so much about my hair and then she comes out and says she hates her natural hair and she says it and unbeknownst to her like it it was completely out of her own control and then she catches it and then she looks at me and she looks at me look at her because of the situation and then i realized that the the situation had nothing to do with me or what i look like it was because she felt some type of way, I'm gonna just say it like that. She felt some type of way about herself deep down and she just needed some sort of outlet to try and put that onto so she could feel better about herself. And I think that that's going on in a much larger scale than just with her, not just what, well, I mean, that's also pretty obvious because weave is basically the, the hottest commodity in the black female community right now. So. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of deep psychological things that we need to address first before we start going back to the idea of fighting any sort of covert or overt white white supremacy. Because at the end of the day, and this is something this is something that I've been very familiar with for a very long time. Matter of fact, uh, in certain communities, people have said that my great specialty is subterfuge and uh, sedition. Um, you never, when, if you're going to war with the people, you never want to overtly attack them. Never. You always want to try and find something to attack them covertly. Matter of fact, I was, I literally was just watching a Twilight, a Twilight Zone episode about that too, uh, yesterday for inspiration for the show that I told you about Irene that I'm starting. Um, and the theme of that episode was, um, a spaceship comes down from the sky. The The entire town sees it. There's about 20 or 30 characters. And one of the kids says that he so he read in a book that the aliens will turn off the power because that was the theme of the episode. The aliens shut off the power in all of the machines on the uh, in the town. So the guy says 
they sent a family that looks just like humans to infiltrate us. And the entire theme of the episode is these people look like us, but they're not like us. And eventually it comes around to where the aliens say, um, we don't necessarily have to attack them to take over the planet. We can just turn off the power. We can make them think things that they otherwise shouldn't think and their own paranoia will destroy them. But that's basically the way that most armies operate. If you look at China, if you look at Russia, that's basically how most armies operate. If you have an enemy that's too strong physically, you deal with them with affairs of the mind. And that's how black people are, fall, are, are failing right now. Because most of our issues for the last 60, 70 years have not been overt. They've had nothing to do with active white oppression. It's been things that are actively seated in our minds that we just won't confront. And all the white people need to do, if they want to do anything at all, is just throw, t turn off the power. And, you know, to turn off the power is a, a stand in for whatever, um, for whatever stimuli they use. Preach, Dark Prophet. Preach, brother. Yes, I have to say I agree with him. But the wacky world of TV, I will not go off. <laughs> you go ahead. And <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll cede the floor to Wacky because I don't want to talk for too long. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, uh, uh, hello to you guys, Irene, Mr. and Dark. All right. My name is the Wacky World of OTV. And uh, concerning the topic of the use of the N-word, it's just that I guess Irene and Mr. You know, made a point in now. I guess I'm probably just repeating the point that they made, in which to me is sort of hip, hip, hypocritical for when it comes to the N-word and how so-called black people use or perceive that word, because it's like at one hand they say it's a term of endearment, but in the other hand, when a person that's of another race uses it. They have this fake outrage, as Irene and uh, Mister mentions, and to me that's hypocritical because if it's a term of if the N word, okay, or the term nigger, if it's a term of endearment, then therefore it should be a term of endearment no matter who uses it. Now, if it's hurtful when you hear, let's say, a Caucasian person use the term, then it's not a term of endearment. It, it should be either one or the other. It should, you know, you can't you can't have both. You know, and this concept of you know that so-called black people have, in which they decide which race could use it. This race could use it. That race could use it. I might like, hold on for a minute <laughs> because if the shoe was on the other foot, right? And let's say the Caucasian collective came together and said, "Well, you know what? We could we as Caucasian." could all use this word but you so-called blacks you can't use it man black people will be out there screaming <laughs> uh, uh, uh marching protesting pissed off talking about this is racist how come we can't use the word so it's like you know we're being very hypocritical we we in a way we're being discriminatory on who can use a word and who cannot and to me i think it's just dumb you know, it's either all people could use it or no one could use it. Can I just, I want to speak to what Dark Prophet said. And I completely understand where Mr. is coming from. But I agree with Dark Prophet in the sense that when we talk about, so I agree with Mr. in the sense that there are real actionable things, right? that are effectual like in the day-to-day -day lives of black people that we need to be concerned about right however i think that dark prophet is very correct in that to even address the actions that are being taken to oppress or harm the black community we must address the psychological things that are pollutive in our community so that we can even come together to deal with those things. You know, case in point, this, this uh, white man who, inf you know, is accused of infecting almost 600 um, females with HIV, many of them as young as 13 years old. 
in the black community. I watched all over social media as black people literally started attacking each other because of what one white man did to 600 people and many of them are children. And I just thought this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Like, is this not a disorder? Every time a white person does something, we start ripping each other apart. We can't even focus on the person who was engaging in child rape and infecting children with HIV, 13 year old little girls with HIV. We can't even focus on him long enough because we're so ready to rip each other apart. And so I definitely think that we have to address these issues. We have to address, you know, um, how black women have issues with submission and black men are having issues with leadership. We have to address why we don't have our eyes on our children, how a white man was able to move with impunity in the black community whilst having sex with children. We have to address why when a group of white people or a singular white person does something, we fight amongst ourselves. We have to address why we are still working for the bait and switch um, that Dark was alluding to, which is that even in when the eugenics movement started, they said we can not infiltrate their communities, right? Back to your alien comment, send in a black doctor that we will train, somebody that looks like them. And they will just fall in line because it's a black person. And now we kill more of our children than anybody. We have to address what makes us, um, as the Wacky World of TV was saying, we have to address what makes us say that we have retaken a word, changed it, put an A on it, and knocked the ER off, and now it has a totally different meaning, but the meaning's not different enough that we know it means the same thing. Because when somebody else uses it, we have a problem. Because we know that the meaning hasn't changed. Well, I, I think there's, there's, I think we're trying to separate the utilization of the term from the ways in which systems, situations, our structures, our structure for our oppression. And I think that's, I think that's an error in the way we're kind of analyzing this, because I think there's a symbiosis in this. And here's what I mean by this. When they actively, I mean, when their actions are calling us to N-word, that has symbiosis. That has a symbiosis when we come back in the community and we view our brothers and sisters as the N-word or as bees, so on and so forth. So again, that's just not some organic internalized hate that we all have or some of us have, right? That's constructed because of systems that are placed upon us, you know? And I know Umar's, I mean, people are not a big fan of Umar, but he said this on the first um, Hidden Colors, which is very true. And I've seen this frustration. Hell, I've been to this frustration. I think most of the brothers on this panel have been to this frustration. You're going out. You do everything you're supposed to do, whether that's attaining education, keeping your nose clean, you know, doing everything you're supposed to do in order to attain a position, you know, whatever the case may be. You get turned down again and again, you know, especially if you're not being entrepreneurial, right? You're trying to, you know, go through the corporate ladder or whatever the case may be, and you get turned down time and time again and everything, yes, there's going to be some frustration. And I'm not saying this as an excuse, but there's going to be frustration. That's the reason why you have domestic situations at the home. That's the reason why brothers bump into each other and just losing and, and killing them the brother, right? Because that's when they internalize the N-word that they have you know, within themselves and they view other people that way. So this is not to be taken, you know, this is not a bifurcated thing. This is all very intersectional. So again, when I say our focus should be looking at the ways in which their actions are calling us the N-word, reconstruction, Jim Crow, you know, the war on drug, mass incarceration, that's them through systems calling us the n-word over and over again and we don't even have to go through enslavement right i mean because that's obvious but again if we're to me just perseverating on the word i think we're losing the big picture here 
I'm not saying the word doesn't matter because it does, but I think we're giving it too much credence and we should be looking at the actions and how that leads to us having this internalized view of ourselves with this kind of vitriolic word. So I would say this, I would agree with you to a point and that point would be um, two things. Number one, as you always say, words matter, right? And so it's not about the word. It is about the mentality behind the word. And I want to be clear. I, I, I just, I feel like I need to say this because I was just sitting here thinking it. I want to dispense with this narrative that we change the word to take power of it. Because the reality is even in chattel slavery, we were calling each other nigga with an A. And it was not a term of endearment. It was stupid nigga, nigga, get over here. It was our broken way, right? Because we have a broken English that we speak overwhelmingly in the black community because it was not our ancestors' first language and we learned from them how to speak. It was our broken way of calling each other nigger, but we did not have the hard ER. And so we used the term the way it was used by our ancestors. We didn't retake crap. Because we've always used that term since we started saying that term in chattel slavery. And it's not the word. It's not the word. But I think that words matter for the exact same reason I hate the word transgender. Because there's no such thing as a transformation of gender. Right? Words form our perceptions. And words can also limit our, our, our mode of expression. They can limit our mode of thought. So words have a lot of power, but more than the word itself, it's the mentality that comes behind what we're saying, right? So when a person says, fuck you, it is not the fuck you that is the problem, right? It is what is going through their mind or what do they think of you? You know, have you ever had your, your partner or a, a cousin or a parent say something real crazy to you. And it's not even what they said, it's the energy and the thought and the emotion behind what is being said. So although we have to, I, I would say that in the same way we talk about, we have to focus on how what they're doing is treating us like a nigger, right? We have to focus on that. We have to focus on what we're doing because, and that's why I brought it back to slavery when we originally started using this word toward each other. We have to focus on how our behavior and our thought process amongst each other, where we're treating ourselves like niggas too, right? Where we don't want to do business with each other because we don't do business with niggers. We do business with white people where we don't believe anything until a white person says it because niggers are stupid. White people are smart and we get our information from them. Where we feel that white beauty is superior because niggers don't live in the big house. White women do. Where we, feel, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that it is not about the word. It is about sometimes we engage in cultural behavior without an understanding of how that was passed down and what the implication is on a deeper level, on a cerebral level, right? And that that behavior then has influence on what actions we can and cannot take in our mode of thinking. So it's not about the words, right? And and I think this is a fascinating conversation to me because our anger at hearing this word, the modified version, so-called, right? Even though my argument is not modified, it's how we have said it since slavery. We haven't modified crap, right? It's just an ebonic, if you don't mind the term, way of saying nigger. But we see the reality in that when the word leaves other people's lips. And even to address their tyranny, we have to recognize that a lot of our behavior toward each other is reflected 
in the way that we deal and speak to each other and that the truth of our words and our beliefs about each other is exposed when the very words we use pass the lips of somebody outside of our community. And then we have to the veil and the facade and the illusion of what we claim it is, is lifted. And it, it is then exposed for the energy that it is. And I think it is that shame that we see the word for what it is when it leaves their lips that is problematic for us because then it indicates that us using it amongst ourselves means something different than what we have said. And it exposes a pathology in the black community about how we view ourselves as black people. Well, I think this will be a perfect time for me to jump in. <laughs> and uh, as most of the time, well, I'm not going to say most of the time, about 60, 70 percent of the time, I 100 percent agree with you, Auntie. Um, but I wanted to get back to what Mr. was saying, because I feel like I should drive up this point home. I don't necessarily think that the important thing that we should do is look at, like I was saying earlier, overt actions of, you know, conflict against black people by white people. And the reason why I say that is going back to what me and Irene have been saying pretty much for like the last maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Um, if white people wanted a war with us, like for the let's say uh let's let's say this uh this continuation of slavery started in reconstruction era the best thing for them to do would keep us would be for them to keep us psychologically in a slave mentality they wouldn't have to keep beating us with whips because we would continue to beat ourselves with whips which is one of the reasons why i'm very opposed to the idea of uh beating your kids because that's basically the continuation of slavery, but that's that's a conversation when it, within itself. Um, but like I was saying earlier about the idea of controlling the mind or creating subterfuge, subterfuge through paranoia, that's basically the re that's basically what's keeping us down right now. Because the scenario that I was talking about with the episode of the Twilight Zone is essentially the exact same thing that you see with Black Republicans or Black conservatives. The same exact paranoia that you saw with those people, the monsters or the aliens, the same paranoia that you saw in that village is the exact same paranoia that you'll see in Black in the Black community whenever somebody says that they're conservative or they, that, they, that they support Trump. It's the same skepticism. And it's the same vitriolic reaction. And like I was saying before, you have to address that first. And probably that's the first thing, that's the only thing that you need to address because white kids aren't necessarily about the same sort of racism that their grandfathers and great grandfathers were on. Like if you talk to a white kid, like if most of the white kids that I've talked to that are around my age and younger don't really have any important distinction between the idea of black people and white people and any other race of people for the most part. So the idea is you don't necessarily have to actively have white people trying to be against us because when your generation and beyond starts to age out, the black community is still going to have those same psychological issues from slavery even for the next 60 years even when there aren't any white people actively perpetuating any of the oppression that we have we don't necessarily have to fight the idea of white people physically oppressing us because that's going to naturally die out in the next 40 to 60 years when the older white people die out because it's naturally been dying for the last 60 or so years because most people are more and more against the idea of oppression or discrimination of any any kind if they watch their parents closely so that's the reason that's the reason also why i say that we should also focus on the idea of the psychological because when we don't when we don't have a physical battle to fight 
we'll still have those same psychological things if we don't deal with it now. That's the same, that's the same way of saying um, how we still have distrust of Arabs and Muslims from 9-11. It's been almost 20 years since 9-11 and the war has been dying down actively for the last almost 10. And yet there's still a distrust of Muslims because it doesn't necessarily matter what happens on the physical battlefield, it's what's in your mind. It's the prejudices, the prejudices that you continue to have that you won't confront, which is one of the reasons why I don't necessarily completely dis discredit the liberals and the Democrats every time but they're so outlandish now that i can't really say that out loud without feeling silly well i mean i'm not talking about physical brute just dominant force so i'm talking about more hegemony right so powers through systems and axes and everything that force black folks in a certain positionality right so an employment um the war on drugs those type of things where employment you know the ways that schools are structured school board government those type of things those are still the ways in which i feel um white folks are calling black folks the n-word without lifting a thumb without doing anything it's just the policies, the practices, the procedures that begin to have. I, I'm not in a disagreement with you, but I think they're they run in concert with each other. There's an intersection with these two mechanisms that I think causes black folks. And I think is is I think it's bi-directional. I think it goes both ways. I think you could have these systems in place that causes black people to have this this sort of you know these you know these psychological issues this kind of internalized hatred with themselves and each other and i think that's something they could have like irene alluded to earlier where they just feel as though you know whiteness is property this is cheryl harris like whiteness is god right so they have to view everything through that lens so i just don't think these things are separate i think these things run you know concurrently and i think you know sometimes one could lead to the other and sometimes the other can lead to the other. So I, I just don't see those, these situations as distinct. I just see them as part and parcel as one big issue. Well, I would somewhat agree with that. But what I don't want you to misunderstand is I'm not necessarily knocking the idea that it may exist. It's that I'm talking about what we should actively put our energy towards. Because in any war or any battle or any conflict, you have a set of you have a set number of resources. Psychological resources are the same as any physical resources. Matter of fact, that's what people typically call morale. Morale is an actual resource. And the morale of black people right now is completely destroyed. And the reason why it's destroyed isn't necessarily because of the white boss not giving you an xyz job or not having xyz amount of faith in you or you not getting xyz promotion a lot of it really does come from the idea that we're doing it to ourselves not just on the individual base but on a, com a collective base and i'm not going to get into the whole uh the whole spiel about you know, the crabs in the bucket mentality, because we literally be here for about three or four hours. And we I don't think any of us have time to do that. Um, but yeah, I think that we we devote so much time and energy to fighting every single injustice that we may perceive that we put none of the energy where we actually need to fight the battle. Because like I said, I'm at an HBCU. I see this all the time. I've, matter of fact, I came in, the year that I came in was the year of Trump's election. They had basically every student at the polls to vote for Hillary Clinton. 
and that's something that happens all the time like there's actual like vote parties there's actual marches to the polls from my school that's a thing so you put so much energy into making black people as a whole fight for whatever whatever specter that you put in front of them and like you can it's 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 easy to control black people nowadays i'm gonna just i'm gonna just say it objectively it's easy to control black people nowadays all you need to do is say xyz person doesn't like them and then you'll just have a mob ready for ready to destroy whatever it is because you have to have you have to be able to fight the things that are actively attacking you in your own mind and when you're not doing that you're looking for something to go to war with and go typically it's the wrong thing and i, I i'll let you uh get your word in auntie because uh, i see you're ready to say something <laughs> well yeah i just was gonna say that i obviously Mr. and I agree on a lot of things, but we don't agree on everything. But I think a great way to paint this picture, first of all, I want to say I do believe there's a um, there's a relationship, right, between the two things. But I want to say this. All right. So you put somebody in a cage, right? And, oh, okay. <laughs> Literally, you put somebody in a cage. People who go to prison. We've heard of individuals who have a hard time when you release them, they just want to go back to prison. Like literally, they need to go back to prison because they don't even know what to do in the real world because they're so institutionalized, right? Yeah, recidivism. That's why it's so high. So, well, like even, um, yeah. So maybe they recommit crimes or some of them have even verbalized, right? There've been some studies on this that they just... They, they got comfortable with that life to the point where they don't feel comfortable in the outside world. And so I think that that speaks to what Dark Prophet is saying, which is essentially that I feel like we've spent a lot of time focusing on what um, they are doing, right? But the thing is, if everything they are doing stopped today, I strongly feel the mental state collectively of our people is so broken. We would be like a prisoner who was being released after a 50 year stint. We would just want to go back. We would be paralyzed. We wouldn't know what to do because our minds are still very chained. Our minds are still very lost. This is why when we talk about like what Mr. was saying, um, institutionalized racism, right? This is why when we get black people in power, they do nothing really for black people overwhelmingly because it doesn't matter if they're in power, if their minds are still enslaved. It doesn't matter what position you put them in. This is why that judge was whispering in the ear of Amber Geiger and giving her hugs. Because it doesn't matter that she's sitting on a bench and has an opportunity to enforce the law and show that black life is equally valuable to white life, forgiveness or not, you shall be punished, right? To the fullest extent of the law. It doesn't matter that they put her on that bench because her mind is still chained. So while we can focus on them, 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 and don't get me wrong, I've ultimately, we have to deal with them, right? Nothing accomplished there. If they all just magically today just stopped, we would be our own slave masters because our collective minds are so chained that even when we do get influence, we see our musicians out there. They could do anything but their minds are so changed. They're putting on dresses and singing about having sex with multiple women and how only certain groups of black women are desirable or how great their vaginas are. Like this is what we do with power and money. We get positions, right? We have a man in office who's half black and he can do nothing for black people. We have um, historically black colleges and universities, like the young brother was saying, 
where they round up black people to go vote for a woman who wants an abortion clinic on every other block in predominantly black neighborhoods, effectively enabling genocide because our minds are still chained in a college full of black people. Chained minds, march them to the poll for their own extermination. Explain that, it, will, it doesn't matter what they're doing. We will do it to ourselves if we don't get a hold of these mental issues here. Our biggest problem in today's society is us. It's not them because they let us in some doors and we don't even make the impact we could make there because it doesn't matter where they let their pets in. Their pets are well-trained. We don't pee on the carpet. Uh, may I say something, uh, Irene? Sure. Wait, can I just be like, uh, <laughs> damn, that was uh, oh, pretty oh, powerful. Oh, 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 <laughs> no, oh, you, no you, you had the floor. I just wanted to comment on how uh, powerful that that was one of those powerful speeches, but uh, uh, yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm hearing how, uh, you know, uh, the narrative of how our minds are still chained. You know, it, it, you know, we're still in the slave mentality. But I'm to the belief that in this day and age, we have the key to unlock the chain. And a lot of us are just comfortable staying in the chain, if you know what I mean. You know, I don't I don't I don't think that there's this outside source that even if a, if some outside source is trying to keep us in chain, we still live it at a time where we could just ha where we have a key and just unlock ourselves. Because I'll say this, I don't have a slave mentality. You know, some people might say that's not true. You know, if you were born and raised in the America all your life and you're a so called black person, you have a slave mentality. Might not, I don't. I don't. I mean, <laughs> you know, so I just think that a lot of us as so-called blacks, we're just content when it comes to having a certain way of thinking in our communities or in our neighborhoods. We're just content and we're just comfortable and we're not really comfortable with thinking outside of the box. Who's going to take the floor this time? Well, I mean, listening to what everybody's been articulating, I think is all well thought out, great thought, provoking, provocative. Um, and these conversations have been have been had in the past, and I'm pretty sure they'll happen again in the future. Um, I am a person of okay, how do we situate some action? And again, I'm of the belief that we do have to hold ourselves accountable. And I think it was Jamasa Kajubu who said we, you know, think, you know, racism is just solely on white people. We give them too much credit, right? And this is what Carter G. Woodson was saying in the mis you know, education of the Negro, right? So a lot of us are educated to do white people's work. You know, as a critical race theorist, I believe that racism is permanent. So I know that there is some internal racism that we share, but okay, with that being said, and we know racism is situated through axioms, through multiple axioms, right? I mean, not axioms, through multiple dynamics, right? And so how do we, where do we go from here? So again, we know a lot of the minds of black folks, they think that white folks ice is you know, much cooler for the most part. We have some of us that are a little bit more radical, we have some of us that are shrewd. We're in there kind of like, you know, the spook who said by the door. But how do we sustain these types of, of actions to get us in a position where, to me, going back to the original conversation, that word, although words does matter, but we begin to take the sting out of it. You know what I mean? We begin to take the sting out of it. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the movie, um, what is it with Lawrence Fishburne, um, Deep Cover, when the guy asked him, he said, what if somebody called you a nigger? And, you know, it was several people, brothers got up and choked the white dude. He said, well, the nigger is stupid enough to answer that question. You know what I mean? So basically not giving feet to that, 
not responding to that. You know, so how do we get to a place where we have more autonomy, more agency to do the things that we're collectively saying in our own nuanced way instead of just, you know, which is going to tend to be some empty rhetoric. And again, I know this is not a pot chat. Us. I know we're all doing our things maybe, you know, individually, but as a respective, how do we push this conversation to some action where, again, that's not even an issue. And here's what I mean by this. We're not the only, you know, um, minoritized group that that there is a derogative, you know, term associated with them. You know, look at the Asian community, look at, you know, the Latinx community, you look at different communities, they have slurs too. And again, I can't speak for them, but I'm just assuming that there's not this, you know, this pre preservance, this, this, this just stuck on the conversation of, you know, a slur because they're getting things done whether it's they're open up businesses. And again, I understand how people are viewed as the, um, what is the term, the, the, which, the, the model minority. I get that. I understand all those things. But there's still a collectivity that those groups tend to have and a willingness to work together that often we don't exhibit, often, because I think more of it's coming. But how do we get to more of the action part? Because again, we could have this conversation and say, okay, well, there's psychosomatic. Wait, 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 babe. I'm so sorry. Wait, I just have to say this. We don't work together because niggers don't do business with niggers, nigga. <laughs> really? Really? I'm just saying, I'm just I'm we don't, right? You don't you don't do business with niggers. That's all I'm saying, nigga. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know Asians that run around calling each other gooks. But, but I just that, haven't heard it. I, gook is not prevalent in the Asian. But, but my point is, I don't and, think and, they get up talking about that. I think they get caught up in in the collective economics and everything. Because guess what? People still may call them, you know, some type of derogatory term. But guess what? You want to get your um, sweet and sour of chicken. You want to get your nails. <laughs> you want to get this. Guess yeah. what? So you could call them anything they want, but guess what? They go into the bank to deposit that money and they're helping their community. That's yeah, but, the point uh, where I think uh, we need to be. Go ahead, brother. Um, but, but mister, the reason why these other groups are not caught up on, you know, the slurs that's referred to their groups is because they're not busy calling each other these slurs like Irene, you know, just pointed out. You know, Asians at a high level not calling each other gooks. You know, the towns at a high level is not calling each other wops or guineas. You know, <laughs> so-called Jews are not calling each other kikes at such a high level as much as we're calling each other niggas. So they're not worried about that. And not only that, you know, we all know that a lot of these groups have a common code of conduct in which they refuse to disrespect each other in public. In which, and the code of conduct also enforces working together and you know family values so there's a specific integrity in which these groups have been taught in which they and, and because they have that integrity they don't use these words so that's why it's not a big deal with them yeah you know us is sort of different because <laughs> uh you know unfortunately we don't have that sort of we no longer have that sort of code of conduct amongst each other and then we sitting there using these derogatory slurs uh, towards one another that you know like irene pointed out that makes us think you know uh low of each other and but, thus reinforces this no. hatred amongst each other well, so uh, unless if we get rid of that then we could unless if we get rid of that then we could start working together. Well, we get my, you know, so we, we, it's a monetization when we use these terms, so whether it's, you know, hip hop, you know, whether it's our movies, like I said earlier, you know, these things are able to be said by us, you know, no, no other group. So again, this is the outside influence in us and like, okay, and we, we keep it going. We, we, we reiterate it because there's some monetary value in doing these type of things. It's like, oh, well, if I degrade each other, if I talk about my sisters and brothers and everything, use this term in my lyrics and everything, oh, 
I, I see, you know, the the gold at the end of the rainbow. But if I'm more of a conscious rapper, if I'm talking about uplifting and everything, I don't get any shine. So people look at it and say, okay, well, what, what's in it for that? You know what I mean? What, what, what do I get at that? And here's the eerie irony with that. Black folks love you when you shine. I mean, I'm not taking shots at R. Kelly, but again, we know the things he's been alleged to do, but he could sing, you know, handsome, all these other things. Doesn't matter. He's a celebrity, you know, but if you have a person of morals and ethics and everything, and you have talent, but again, you're not getting that shine, black folks ain't really trying to fool with you, you know, as much. But again, that's a conditioning that we have that's thrust upon us, and it's the one that's also internal. So again, how do we move to a place where we are supporting our brothers and sisters who we don't deem niggas or niggers? Hey, actually, well, that, 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 I, wait, can okay. I actually put a note on that? Um, well, no, you go, you go, wacky, because I sort of lost my place and I don't want to take too much time. You, you, you do your response first, wacky, and then I'll sort of come back to where I was. Oh, oh, thank, thank you, Doc. I'll be brief. Uh, but, but, Mister, like I said, uh, it is due on the part of so-called blacks. What you describe is due to so-called blacks lacking a code of conduct amongst each other. Because, it, it, you know, at, at one point, so-called blacks in America had that, but we lost that along the way. If we regained that code of conduct or kept that code of conduct. Amongst each other, uh, I don't, I don't think it'll, I don't think that word "nigger" would be such, you know, a, uh, would, <laughs> it would be such a a uh, popular word in popular culture now, you know. So what you just said is just due to a lack of code of conduct. You know, I would not say a conditioning. I'll say more so a lack of moral values and code of conduct that we must regain in order for we could uh uh do away with that madness well i i didn't really remember the point that i was trying to get across but one point that i would like to say is that what we've been talking about for like the last hour and a half or so is basically the reason why a lot of black people can't work together because they psychologically hate themselves and oh, I remembered the point. I remembered the point. Um, because you were that's what it was. You were talking about, Mr. You were talking about the idea that we can support people that are in high places, but not people that are moral in high places. And I wanted to bring up the idea that moral people in the black community as a whole are a mirror. And the reason why it's important to look at how moral people are um, treated in the black community is because they serve as the proof of everything that we've been saying for the last hour and a half. Because bl black people don't have a visceral reaction to good people because they hate good people. They ha have a visceral reaction to good people because they serve as a mirror that shows them the deficiencies that they're afraid to confront. The same deficiencies that we've been saying that black people have been afraid to confront, those good people that are successful are the people that are showing them that if they were to confront themselves, that's what they could be. Because black people, black people want to believe, well, black people in America want to believe that they can't succeed. They want to believe that they can't do but sing, but rap, but be a basketball player. If you are a quote unquote good person in the black community, you're just a mirror. And they don't have a visceral reaction to you just because they have a visceral reaction to you. Is because you're actively showing them all of the things that they subconsciously know about themselves, but they're afraid to confront. So all of the things about what their parents weren't, all of the things about what they are not now because of what their parents were, that all comes to the forefront when they see that one person. And I don't necessarily think everybody, uh, all uh, most black people are, everybody really has that same visceral reaction towards black people. I know a lot of them do, enough for it to be a noticeable phenomena because I'm not gonna bring my personal experience into it, but I've, 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 noticed, uh, I've noticed some things about that but for the sake of argument we're going to 
um, keep on topic. But yeah, I think that these quote unquote people that want to be in high places that are moral and just and would actually do something for black people, um, they aren't getting the same sort of recognition because of what I just said. And that goes back to what I was saying about you have to confront the psychological before you can confront anything else because we don't want the people that actually could do something to succeed because we're afraid as a people that they're showing us what we aren't. And when you're showing us what we aren't, we're going to naturally want to destroy that or want to take that down because that's the natural human uh, that's the natural human evolutionary way of dealing with something that you deem is better than yourself. If you see an alpha male, or if you see somebody that can mate with more women, or if you see something that is going to be a danger to you, your primal, your primal hind brain is going to tell you to destroy that. That's the exact same thing that's happening in the black community as a whole. It's the most primal urge in every human. And that's why I say we have to deal with the psychological because our primal hindbrain is telling us X, Y, Z presents a danger to us. We have to destroy that person. And yeah. so you have it twofold where you can't confront yourself because psychologically you don't want to destroy your entire, your entire perception of existence. And second, you don't want to confront the idea that something can be better than you. Because then if you're proven or if you think that you're inferior, then you have to find some way to make yourself better. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a very pathological psychosis, because and again, for me speaking, you know, it's not when we ever get to a situation where iron sharpens iron. I mean, so if it's a brother or sister that has a greater acumen than I have. Or something that I am aspiring to become, and I'm just speaking for myself and people in my circle. A lot of us are not going to have a whole bunch of hater rate. Like, oh, look at this era right here. Oh, he or she thinks she's all that. Now I know that does exist in our community. I'm not naive to that fact, but I just don't think that's the lion's share of the majority of the people in our community. Um, but I, 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 I hear your point that that pathology does exist within because just speaking for myself i look at somebody i'm like okay i may want to aspire to that that's motivation for, for me again it's not an attack or an indictment of that person but again it's just something that i can try to try to aspire to become or some ways in which i can learn from that person because again when you're talking about mirrors and reflection once we give people you know the credit and the flowers why they still could smell them and everything that's a reflection of us so if i ran across you young brother and everything and you may have on a nice suit or something and i'm like okay brother you're looking sharp that's a nice suit that's a reflection of me seeing you know the beauty within you and i know we have that in our community we just tend not to exude that enough because again it's not it's not viewed as as the norm you know it's not as viewed as the narrative that we have within our community and i think we could change that and again that's looked at soft like oh and then the person that we may be acknowledging like hey that's cool they may look at you with some type of this thing like like in word what you doing giving me compliments or giving me some praise and everything you know you should be hating on me like everything else so again it goes both ways and it's just something that we need to work on within our community. Well, if I may, um, okay, wait, hold on. Let me, let me, can someone take the floor while I, uh, while I rearrange my thoughts? That's fine. I just want to say that, um, or a wacky world, did you have anything to say? Okay. I just want to say that I agree with uh, the Wacky World of TV and that we have the tools that we need to progress, but I don't think that our people want to progress. And I think that I wanted to address, oh, that's what I want to say. 
I wanted to address what Mr. was saying earlier about, because you've said it a few times, babe. You've been like, you know, these conversations have been had time and time again, like several times over. And I hear a lot of people making that argument. But I think something is really important to note, right? Are history books, um, television, commercials, society gives uh, an extreme repetition of thought. And by being inundated with like the same thing over and over and over again throughout our lives, it really forms the way that we think. So I feel like a lot of times in the black community, we talk about um, how we've already discussed this. We've discussed this so many times. We've, you know, we've gone here before, but in the grand scheme of things, we really have not, right? And we definitely haven't had the time or the generations to have had these discussions over and over again to the point where we've been able to move far enough from the bread mindset and the bread bodies of our ancestors from chattel slavery. Our minds are very still in tune with that mindset. Our bodies are still very in tune with that. I mean, think about it. You know, we still were being terrorized less than a hundred years ago, right? We were still being nearly enslaved and having our bodies and our businesses violated just 60 years ago. So I feel like we need to have the aggression of repetition in the same way here in our community as they do in the world surrounding us. It takes repetition. It takes revisiting these topics over and over, reasserting our positions over and over to dispel the constant bombardment of propaganda that has been pushed on us for hundreds upon hundreds of years. And this, especially in this new age, right? Where we have access to internet, where we're able to have these discussions amongst people who are from all over the world in various time zones, this is unheard of. And just like they use their social media to push BS music and topics that don't matter, and every news station says the same thing, there's a reason for that. And we need to start utilizing these same tools of propaganda and programming amongst ourselves to deprogram us from thinking in line with the status quo so we can never revisit this nest and, and always know that it might be old for some of us, but a lot of these conversations are new for a lot of our people, especially our younger generations. And the, I, I hearken back to the brother whose article we started with. It was the repetition of three generations ago of a gay man that influenced another black child who then turned out to be a gay man that influenced now a straight black male who believes himself to now be an inverted white woman. And so we cannot revisit this enough because they're not going to stop revisiting their talking points. So we can never stop revisiting ours or we risk losing people. Oh, well, well is somebody gonna take the floor? Cause I kind of remembered the point that I was gonna make. Well, I would just say just following up what Irene said, just not just reducing it to talking points where we can't speak to any actions that have occurred so the revisitation of those talking points, but there could be some analysis of some things that we have done, maybe right or wrong, but just the rhetoric becomes empty if they're just uh, if we're just revisiting it without nothing has occurred over time. So I do agree with that. These things have to remain kind of present because of the kind of you know biogenerational kind of gaps that are there. I, that, that's an excellent point. 
we always need to hear the energy of you know our younger brothers and sisters and i think we always need to hear the wisdom of hopefully the wisdom of older brothers and sisters but i, I just would hope that there would be some some action throughout those um conversations that we could have further analysis and hopefully we could you know ameliorate the situation that we're you know we're talking about well uh if i can go back a little bit about five minutes into the conversation well five minutes you know five minutes back into the conversation i recall you were saying something about the idea of um you personally you know uh complimenting someone that you felt was doing good or using that as somebody to aspire to. And I always like whenever that sort of thing comes up because I I have quoted the same uh, essay to death because I'm a Jeffersonialist, a Jeff Jeffersonial, whatever, follower of Thomas Jefferson uh, for the most part. Um, and one of his letters, quote unquote essays, um was the letters the letter to thomas jefferson i want to say october 25th 1813 wherein he describes something called the natural aristois and the pseudo aristois aristois being i think italian for aristocracy so essentially uh thomas jefferson asserts that people naturally have places and people naturally know their place and so naturally the inclination of a healthy society would be uh, whenever the people in the lower rungs see people that are greater, they would naturally prop those people up and that that should be the role of government would be for to find those natural aristocracy, for those natural aristois, find those natural aristois and to prop them up. Well, the reason why I thought that that was important to quote here was because I commonly say that the black community is somewhat inverted when it comes to that. So we still have the same recognition of the natural aristocracy versus the people who are not the natural aristocracy. Um, and we actually do have a pseudo aristocracy in the name of uh, rappers and basketball players and all of that. Matter of fact, we we follow the very definition of the pseudo aristocracy. Um, but anyway, I'm going to try and stay as linear as possible here. <clears throat> um, but whenever we see the natural aristocracy, like I said before, it's something that mirrors to us as a people that we aren't them and for some reason we still I, well i explained the reason why we try and tear them down as a people but so i don't think i need to reiterate that um but i i, I did think that it would be i think that's an important reading for everybody um wait matter of fact let me see if anybody wants to look this up it's thomas jefferson's letter to john adams um october 25th 1813 and there's a copy of it on you chicago's press line um uh, but yes everybody should definitely give that a good read shameless promotion anyway uh, anybody want to take the floor from that i just want to say that i think that's so true and we definitely see that um so we have a vernacular that is unique to black people right with rules and such um because English is not our ancestors. Oh, and this is strange. When we talk about, do we think that we've passed on pathologies? We've passed on language, right? As black people there. And we've tried to name it. Somebody called it ebonics. It has rules and regulations <laughs> and we've passed on a language, but we don't think we've passed on mindsets, right? If we've, managed to maintain consistency in speech, we've definitely managed to maintain consistency in mindset. So part of this, right, is that I agree there's an inversion. We don't promote excelling in the black community except for in the areas of monetary acquisition for purchase of meaningless things, right? Not for investment in meaningful things and sexual, acquisition. 
those are the things that are upheld in the black community. You get money to buy pretty shiny things and you get sexual partners and that is dope. But if you are very, very intelligent, if you learn how to speak the common language, right, of the people, if you um, try to engage in activities to bring other people with you. So say, hey, come do business with me, invest with me. Qbetter has a, an institute for black children, you know, donate to that. We, we, we shy away from those things. We kind of shun those people. We shun the black nerds, you know, to some degree. We shun, you know, individuals who are not staying in a position that we think is befitting of our people on the whole. I mean, I've literally had people say to me that I don't have a black experience or I can't speak because I didn't really have a black life because my family managed to pull, cause I'm Gullah, right? And the Gullah Geechee people are very poor. We have our own lands, but they're not posh lands, right? That's my bloodline. I had people that left the Carolinas and went west and made something monetarily of themselves, right? That's not respected, right? So then as when I step forth as the offspring of those people, it's she's not one of us, right? Not let's work together, let's do business together, let's prop each other up, let's work together. And I'm not saying obviously that all black people have this mindset, but for us to believe or for us to sit and pretend like we definitely have not seen this be very prevalent in the black community would be disingenuous, right? So we do have a very self-destructive nature collectively as a people. And I think if we're not honest about these things, not in a hateful to bash each other way, but honest about them, because if we don't expose, right, the cancers in our community, we cannot get rid of them and grow as a people. And wh whether we like it or not, we will sink or swim collectively, ultimately. We will sink or sw swim collectively. So we must work on it as a group. Well, I, I think one of the things, and we should be approaching the conclusion um, within the next 15, 20 minutes, but I think one of the things Black folks have done routinely, and we still do, is that we get caught up in a lot of symbolism, especially a lot of integration, you know, integrationalism, you know, you know, and not just in Dr. King, but a lot of this, this early rhetoric, you know, is we shall overcome kumbaya. Notice I said earlier because in the end of his life, it was a lot more radical. But we get caught up in that kind of civil rights rhetoric, and oftentimes we get stuck there with our ideology. We can even look at you know Black Lives Matter, and I'm not a big fan of that particular movement, but it's kind of like the same symbolic rhetoric, right? That tends to you know, stay stuck in staccato with black folks, you know, so that's the symbolism. Even when Barack Obama was president, you know, it was that same type of symbolism. Now we're in this post-racial America, right? And that's, you know, what we kind of get stuck in. And any particular movement or ideology that's not within line with that type of civil rights integrationist, you know, post-racial America, you know, type of thought process is is going against the grain. And I'm a person that thinks this, you know, we have to have several modes to address what we're dealing with. You know, we have to have a radical one. We have to have one of self-defense. We have to have the young, you know, energy. We have to have the old, you know, we have to have the multiplicity of ways in which we're going to address this. But again, a lot of times I think we're just stuck in this symbolic, you know, very much integrationalist mindset, very liberal, very, you know, kumbaya, you know, um, our battle was everyone's battle type of thoughts 
that's not to me that's that's that gets us stuck in the same type of situation that we've always been in and we have to get to a situation where we're being unapologetic and moving you know black folks um concerns forward well if i can say something if, if nobody else has anything else to say about that right now i think i could somewhat address that any uh objections to that no go ahead um so what i would say to that is um and i th- i i don't want to speak for uh wacky but i feel like he might he might agree with this i haven't heard from him in a while i don't even know if he's still here <laughs> oh I, I, i'm here I, i'm just doing a lot of listening so <laughs> uh, <me> yeah <laughs> well i think i think wacky might agree with this i think that a lot of the uh you know not wanting to just break away and to make a into making a black ethno state or uh you know becoming like a huge cohesive black community is the idea that the people that could organize such a thing don't want to tack themselves onto a sinking ship and so you have all of these problems like we've been talking about for this entire show that no one else is really addressing at least not in you know to by today's standards um and the people that see what's going on are just like nobody's gonna listen to me matter of fact the perfect example of this is the boondocks have you ever heard of or seen the boondocks this tv show yeah yes yeah Yeah, the, the boondocks is the perfect example of this it is every person that i know has grown up watching the boondocks well almost every person that i know has grown up watching the boondocks and anybody that's watched the boondocks in any significant for any significant amount of time knows that basically the main character is huey and huey's whole thing is that he's the like the whole trope of huey is that he's the intelligent black guy that no one listens to but he's always right that's basically the by the end of the by the end of the series huey's just like eh, i don't really care anymore and that's the entire story arc of huey he's he well i I only use season one through three as canon because season four wasn't written by the original creator so all of that really doesn't have any bearing on the actual plot of the story but seasons one through three is the canon series and huey's entire story arc through that series is He's the intelligent black guy that always tries to save black people from themselves. Black people don't listen. So by the end of the series, he stops wanting to be an activist. And that's ent- that's his entire story arc. And everybody, almost every young black person that I know has seen this and has actively and has actively thought on the messages of the show of the boondocks, but it's still a problem. Like you, you, they they haven't internalized it. They've thought about it, but they haven't internalized it. And I think that that's another reason why a lot of black people, or at least the intelligent black people, don't really want to tack themselves on with black people. And I think that's another reason why you have people that want to marry out, like marry white people, or try and move to the suburbs because they feel like uh, they feel like Huey. They feel like I've said, I've spoken about the problems to death, but at the end of the day, like nobody listens and it's never going to amount to anything. So why even try anymore? It's a defeatist attitude, sure, but it's practical and you can't really deny that it is. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a defeatist attitude. I would say that uh, from that point, you know, a person would feel drained just like how Huey Freeman at the end of the episode, he feels drained and he feels that, Hey, listen, there's only so much I could do. And I put all my energy into helping you and uh, enlightening you and making you aware of certain things, but it's still not sinking in with you. There's nothing else I could do. And I think that's how, you know, a lot of intelligent black people feel and another point uh that you made earlier was a very good point when you stated how 
uh, a lot of intelligent black people are not appreciate enough in their, you know, within their own people, which is sad. And, and you know, it even when you look at it in black social media, whether it's so-called black YouTube or black Twitter, black Facebook, if you are a moral, intelligent, upstanding so-called black person, what is the word that they call you? Coon. Coon. <laughs> Coon. <laughs> Another extremely derogatory word that derives from slavery. Or Jim Crow. Whichever, yeah, whichever one. Another you know? word for nigger. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's a combination of these things. And also, another fact, like I stated earlier, it, it's a lack of values within black America and a lack of a code of conduct in which we don't know, or I say we no, I won't say we don't know, but we have lost, we have lost the ability on how to treat each other and how to conduct ourselves and how to respect each other and what we really uh, 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 prioritize. We, we we've lost we've lost that sort of edge. So a combination of these things is, is, is has resulted on so-called blacks who are intelligent, so-called blacks who do have the potential and the talent to help change the community to say, you know what? I'm out. I'm exiting out. If this is what I see, if I'm going to continue being underappreciated, if I'm going to be called all sorts of sellouts, coons, and what have you for acknowledging the reality that we live in, and if the reality that we live in is going to be ignored and people as a collective do or are not trying to actually help solve the problem, then you know what? I'm going to exit out. Bye. <laughs> and in a way, can you blame intelligent black people for feeling that way? In my opinion, no, you can't. Well, I, I just wanted to chime in. I, I definitely can appreciate it and respect that position because I don't think anyone should be abused um, for fighting a good fight and doing right by our people. But I also think that there's a way in which ego can get into the way. And so if we're doing this work to get, you know, likes or, you know, admiration or some type of recognition, recon recognize or recognition from folks, then I would say we're doing the work for the wrong reason. But with that being said, it's always good to get the flowers right. You still smell them. We should recognize folks. But again, if we're doing that work for just that reason, then it becomes problematic. You know, as I'm listening to both your brothers, I'm thinking about W.E.B. Du Bois, who I mean, who's a very complicated, was a very complicated intellect, right? And so with the talented tenth, again, a lot of people say that was very bourgeoisie and elitist. Again, I think you need them, but I think you need multiple people. And so I think when I hear the conversation about, you know, getting tired, because this work is very tiresome. It's a thankless job working with our people. You know, we, uh, most of us go into this work we know we're not going to get any flowers while we can still smell them, but it's unapologetic work that needs to be done, not for us, but for, you know, the people that are coming, you know, behind us, right? Because our ancestors did the same thing. A lot of the people, you know, paid the way that were surrogates that, you know, put their lives on the line, put their careers on the table and everything for us to be in the type of position that we're in today, a lot of times were unbeknownst to us. You know, these are silent heroes and heroines, right? And so we, to me, I think we have an obligation as much as we possibly can, right? Because I, I don't want to put anybody in harm's way because I can never tell somebody what they should be doing because I'm not in the same situation they're in. So it'd be arrogant for me to say, oh, man, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it's a thankless job. And I think, you know, people, as we get older or wherever you are in this in this fight, right, you always, to me, have to have other people that are extensions of the work. I didn't say extensions of you. I said extensions of the work, because 
if you're doing this fight, and a lot of times it is the case where, you know, you may be the smartest person in the room and people aren't listening to you. Well, to me, with your intelligence, you have to see a way in which that you could reach people. Maybe it's, maybe you're not the person that's going to be in front of them. Maybe it's an older person or maybe it's a younger person. Maybe it's someone else altogether, right? But again, the work still needs to happen. And the ways in which that happens looks different for different people. So again, I understand the frustration, you know, being a black person all my life and, and in particular being a male, the frustrations that we get from the black community. And a lot of times we just want to throw up our hands and say F it, right? Again, I think it's different stages that we have as we go through this fight. You know, once we're when we're younger, we have a lot more energy and fervor, right? And once we get into the middle stages of our life and career and everything, we tend not to be as risky and everything because we have families and we still may be doing things, but just, you know, with a different nuance. And once we get older, we may come full circle to being that more radical person or we may just be, you know, kind of like stewards helping navigating the younger people and, and, and clearing a path for them. But it's a thankless job, right? I mean, we, we don't get recognition and I would just kind of like really <laughs> cause some attention to this type of work that we're doing. It's, 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 it's a thankless job that we do, but it's necessary. And I, I think the people who are coming, you know, after us, again, it's going to be a lot easier for them because we just have to stay the course. But I do understand both of you all's positionality because people do. And I'm one of those individuals like the hell with this. You know, I'm tired of spitting in the wind. So I had to redirect my spit, right? <laughs> I had to direct it in a way where it's going to help. And maybe that's, that's, maybe that's me taking a back seat. That's me maybe writing. That's me maybe doing something different or creating a pipeline or conduit for other younger thought leaders to continue the work because I know it's bigger than myself. Yeah, and I think, um, like, and I'm not saying this because he's my man, y'all, <laughs> but I just think it's important that men like Mr. Speak Up because, you know, we're talking right now in this conversation, often in YouTube, we have conversations with people on these issues who don't have heavy community involvement. But Mr. You know, has a mentoring agency that he has had for years where he mentors young black boys. He runs a program for black youth. Um, he teaches a black studies class. He's over like his, his life, right? his work and everything that he is dedicated to and what he puts his money toward, you know, um, is our people like every day, babe, would you say that's fair? Like that is your life, right? <laughs> like that, that is literally what he does and what he has been doing. Yeah, for that's, pretty, that's pretty accurate. And, and like I literally. said, not to beat, beat the horse. It's, it's, it's a thankless, I don't say it's a job, it's a passion, right? It's, it's just a way of life. But of course it, it, it becomes nuanced because of the various challenges and everything. But again, I'm not saying I'm a know-it-all because I don't. That's why I really appreciate, you know, other energies, other perspectives and everything, because I'm learning as I listen to you all. So again, it just makes the work, you know, it works, makes the work better for me because I know I still have a lot of learning to do in this regard. But yeah, it's, 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 it's challenging because I, I, I understand what the brothers are saying. It's, man, people, I mean, you're literally spending your money, you know, and time and dime and everything in efforts to help, you know, brothers, sisters, community, and they're literally shitting on you. I mean, I mean, they're almost like literally, you know, it's like E2 Brute. It's like, wait, wait a minute. And you just have to navigate. I mean, almost doing it despite... <laughs> of our people. You know what I mean? You're doing it despite of them, but to help them. That sounds crazy, but that's the way I look at it because it's crazy. This may sound arrogant. And I think a lot of you all, I think everybody on this panel has this foresight and this vision, right? And sometimes we could see things sometimes that we wish we didn't have, you know, the ability to see that other people don't. 
And with that vision, and everything and provision, we have an obligation to do certain things, even though they may not understand it. And so the way we have to do that is oftentimes very difficult and challenging, but it needs to, it needs to be done nonetheless. Yeah, I'll go ahead, Wacky World. Oh, oh no, to uh, to respond to what Mister was saying earlier, earlier point that he was making. Uh, when I spoke on how intelligent blacks, you know, feel that they don't get enough, they they feel underappreciated, and what, what have you, and that's one of the factors of them just exiting out of helping their people. Uh, I didn't you, I didn't make that, I, you know, I didn't make that point with the intent in saying that. The only reason why so-called blacks should do work in their communities is to get recognition, is to be, you know, I'm not saying that should be the only reason I, you know, I get it that there's a bigger, that there's a bigger goal ahead. But the thing is, when it comes to so-called black people assisting and, and helping or uh, improving the conditions of the collective, the collective must also participate in doing this. And if the collective is not participating, if the collective is having all this infighting, if the collective are just being so rude and disrespectful and so ignorant towards each other and just leaving it to just one or two or just a very few amount of so-called blacks to do a work that the whole collective is supposed to participate in, then in my opinion, I don't blame those few blacks for exiting out because at the end of the day, I feel that these people who exit out, they value their time, they value their energy, and they value their blood pressure. And they're not going to uh, 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 use up all that if they feel that the entire collective is not going to participate to help improve the community. <laughs> no, right. brother, I agree. You can't kill yourself. I, I say this all the time. And I use the word inward. I say in words will kill you. And I don't say in words. I actually say the words. They will kill you. And to that, I say you, we have to get with like-minded people. You know what I mean? And so what I mean by like-minded people, people who are on the same trajectory. Mm -hmm. So they might not have the exact same lockstep ideology, but they're going in the same trajectory. And so I agree with you. Yeah, we, we can't just bump our head up against the wall. It's like, OK, I know there's some people, you know, like mindedness that are going in the same direction. I just have to harness myself around them. It's like, you know, and I don't know, you know, maybe all of you can relate to this. You know, when you go to a conference, you know, and you get re-energized and then you come back or you network and you make some, you know, connections with other people that share your interests, you you become, you have a cadre then of people that support you and everything. And sometimes that's a small network and everything, but it keeps the motion movement going. And a lot of times I agree with you on Wacky World of TV. I mean, you got to cut off some, a lot of folks because they're toxic, right? And they will kill you. And so it's just up to us to make sure we keep the momentum in the movement and we just associate ourselves with people of the same mind. I think too, um, and then I guess everybody can kind of give their closing thoughts because Mr. allotted me like an hour and a half and we've really gone over. But um, I just, I want to say too that when we're thinking about what Mr. referred to as a thankless job of sometimes in working in the community and how people treat you um, either with disregard, disrespect, or just, you know, complete lack of any acknowledgement. We have to recognize too that our people collectively are not in a huge position to reciprocate nor really provide anything um, to those people who are putting in the work to the levels that they deserve, right? We're trying to, you know, we're like a mass of, and I keep going back to this because we can't ignore this. 
our bodies and our minds were bred a certain way for a very long time. And for the initial part of our release from chattel slavery, we were just trying to survive. It was not until around the time of Black Wall Street where we were really building. And then from there, it was an uphill battle to even be safe in an attempt to build, right? And then we saw our communities decimated with drugs um, in the crack epidemic. And so we are literally infants in this thing. We don't have the benefit of other groups of people um, where we have a long history of development in a country, right? Everybody else who is not a victim of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade has the ability of, ha has the benefit of thousands of years of history that they can connect with in a building that people did before them to reward those people who are building now. We, right, have just a few hundred years of even having the ability to make a decision or support anybody in our community in any sort of meaningful way. And I dare say we only have about 100, 120 years of being able to really enact that on any sort of meaningful level because the first little period after slavery, you know, half, half the slaves didn't know they were released. Then they were being locked up. Our men were being locked up to kind of replace the slave bodies that were lost. You know, we're really just 120 years into this game with no foundation other than slavery as our backbone. And so we're just navigating this thing in a way that is unique to our people on this continent. And so we cannot expect our people to deliver what we may see other communities, peoples delivering because that's not our foundation. That's not what we have, right? And so we have to give some sort of a curve for acknowledgement of really what we're dealing with here. We are the builders right now, you guys. We are the builders. We are the people laying the foundation. We have no house. We are literally laying the foundation right now so that generations and generations from now, they will have the benefit of what everybody else has as ADOS, which is an actual foundation to build upon, an actual house to reward people in. We have none of those things. We are the builders. We are putting the cornerstone in now. And I think a lot of times we don't acknowledge or realize that as American descendants of slaves, we do not acknowledge that there is nothing, there's no foundation for us. That when we talk about King, when we talk about um, Black Wall Street, when we talk about the nation of Islam, when we talk, like that's recent history. They were literally just digging the hole so we could pour the cement. We're just barely fashioning bricks on this thing. And so we must acknowledge that um, when we're expe expecting so much from our people that they don't even have a home. We're just making that for ourselves right now. Um, what are everybody's kind of final words? You want to go, mister? No, you go, Dark Power. Hey, or, mister, do you want to go? Hello? Yeah, I think he said you go. I figured oh. he, would, he would let you go first. Well, uh, I guess my final words would be, I don't necessarily think that it's impossible 
to fix the black community. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think that it would be practical for someone to, you know, put in so much effort that they basically destroy themselves. Because uh, one point that Mr. brought up was about W.E.B. Du Bois, or Du Bois, if, whichever one you want to call them, um, about the idea. Oh, that's what I think that might been that might have been uh, what reminded me of Huey of the idea of Huey from the Boondock, because that's basically low key who he was designed after. Because W. E. B. Du Bois actually did the same thing. He was pro black and all that other stuff in his youth, and then when he got older, he was like, ah, these people just don't listen, and he just left, and people got mad at him about that, but. Anyway, uh, yeah, so my closing remarks would be if we're going to do this thing together as a quote unquote people, then we got to address all of the other stuff that we've been talking about thus far. We got to address the psychological issues. We got to address the self-destructive issues. Otherwise, you can't expect every you can't expect the people that actually can do the work to do the work. And that's, I'll just close on that one. Baby? Oh, the other brother left. Okay, so for me, um, in closing, kind of similar to young brother Dark Prophet, just the, the work is the work is the work. And you have to take care of yourself, you know, in anything you do. And especially when we're talking about our community, because it could be taxing and, you know, we'll kill you and say, oh, they were so nice. And that's the end of it. But not making sure we're looking out for that person's family, you know, not, you know, supporting them in the ways in which we could, you know, once they're no longer of use to us, then that's it. And we have to get out of the type of the, those type of habits of, you know, what have you done for me lately type of thing and continue on, you know, with the understanding and mindset that you have to take care of yourself, you know, in all aspects of that, whether it's, you know, financially, you know, spiritually, physically, emotionally, so on and so forth, right? If you're not able to sustain your own well-being, what good are you going to be to anyone else? And so you can't kill yourself in this work because the work will kill you <laughs> anyway, right? So that that's an important thing to keep in mind. But again, the work is very thankless. Um, we have to be unapologetic. We have to remember those who did the work before us that allow us to be in the position that we're in. And to me, I think it's obligatory for us to play it forward, um, at, le at least in the ways in which we could do that, right? And so, again, like I said earlier, hard, you know, be it for me to tell somebody how they have to make a contribution to the Black community, you know, in the ways in which to do that, right? Because I'm not in their proverbial shoes, so I can't say that. But again, as long as we do what we can do, um, you know, collectively, I think we'll be okay. And I agree with the young brother, Dark Rock. We need to hold each other accountable. We need to call, you know, you know, call each other to task on what we are and what we aren't doing. And, and iron needs to sharpen iron. And I think we need to be in a place where we can receive and give constructive criticism to our brothers and sisters so that we can become a better community. And, you know, but it's, it, to me, I'm a little cynical in that regard with it being such a politically correct or so-called politically correct environment. But again, maybe in this kind of ironic way, that's a good thing that we don't get those type of political correctness, um, at least that are acknowledged or we see that's political correctness that is offensive right or some ways that we could say all right black community you can't say this about us but it, that doesn't exist right now in my opinion so that may help us as far as you know having some tough skin but 
long story short, we have a lot of work to do or to be done, but we could do it as long as we keep on this trajectory of having older people, younger people, black-minded people, and supporting each other and however that looks and continuing to fight. Well, I just want to say stay focused, y'all. Stay focused. And if you have negative energy or anger or frustration or any of that, know where that needs to be directed and don't direct it internally in this community, but direct it in the place where it's actually going to affect change. And when we're dealing amongst each other, we need to be focused on pinpointing our collective issues, not to blame and point fingers, but to correct pathologies that have been ingrained in us because of the sordid history of our people. Like I used that example earlier about, you know, the term, the, the, the verbiage we use collectively that has been referred to as Ebonics. If we pass down language generationally, we have passed down some pathologies generationally too. And we need to remove those things because the biggest challenge to black liberation will be ourselves. We will be the biggest challenge to ourselves. And so we need to stay focused and really know who the enemy is and recognize that it's going to take us working together throughout the diaspora. And it's going to take us addressing these issues and these pathologies for us to actually succeed collectively as a people and realize the dream. And other than that, I just want to say, remember that we're laying the foundation right now. We are laying the foundation right now. We are doing the work so that our future generations can build on it. And we have to recognize that. I think that's just hugely important. I don't know. That just like occurred to me today. And I think I'm going to ponder that a little bit more because it's something even I hadn't really thought of that we lack a foundation like other people do. And we're literally sitting here blaming ourselves, not recognizing that we are literally building the foundation of what will be black society for our people because our ancestors are were completely ripped apart from their foundational roots. So we're rebuilding what was lost for our future generations. And we need to take that job more seriously. So. Well, um, you mentioned the word focus. Um, I heard this at a workshop over the past few days. Um, Nike saying says, if we don't focus, they will folk us. And I guess we'll end it on that note. All right. Okay, you guys. So thank you so much. I know this was super late and sorry, mister. It was a lot longer than he allotted me time for, but he was a trooper about it. So, and Dark Prophet, you are so beautiful tonight. Aww. Thank you. Selfless <laughs> shame. So Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead and put your link in the chat um, and you guys subscribe to his channel because we want to, you know, um, support our young people too. Absolutely. Thanks, young brother. Yeah. Uh, Auntie, uh, smile to Joy is asking the next time I'm going to be on the show. Uh, that I think this is a subtle hint that you should have me on the show more often. I think, no, I think, <laughs> I think that's about your page. When are you well, making another video on your page? Well, yeah, but I gotta, can, I gotta have that shameless self promotion, you know. Okay, well, no, just, uh, yeah. So. Just look at that beautiful like ratio down there. <laughs> I haven't even seen it. I'm not, I'm not on YouTube, so I can't see it. It's, it's beautiful. Just trust me on it. 
Oh, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that's all two. you. That's all <laughs> you family. <laughs> yeah, look at the beautiful, the beautiful <laughs> life. Yes, you should definitely have me on the show more often. Yeah, well, <laughs> now that we're stream yarding, and I think I'll just go ahead and buy the little service now. Um, it's easier to have people come up. So, yeah. But yes, yeah, so you guys, um, I will talk to you guys later. Happy Sunday. I think it's Sunday for everybody at this point. It might be Monday for some people. <laughs> like we've officially moved on into next week. So good night, y'all. Oh, and smile to joy. I'm actually making a video right now. So I'll I'm I'm not sure if I want to plug that to this. Wait, can you still hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm not sure uh, if I'm going to put it on this channel or if I'm going to put it on my other, other channel because this is on my student account, and I don't know if I can actually keep this account after I graduate and I graduate later this year. So, uh, yeah, I'll put it on both, actually. I think I can transfer ownership of this account to my other account, and I can keep all of the information on it, but... We'll have to see. So right now, I'm just going to post everything that I do to both channels, since this one already has a few subscribers. Sounds very pragmatic. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. So you guys go and check out his channel. And um, yeah. Thank you. I'll leave you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye, Auntie. Bye, <laughs> Uncle. <laughs>